Well, good morning, everybody. And thank you for connecting into uh, both this morning's webinar and hopefully tomorrow morning's webinar as Oregon OSHA has partnered with the Association of Drilled Shaft Contractors, otherwise known as the International Association of Foundation Drilling. And uh, we are presenting some uh, very beneficial and very important information uh, this week, coming in the week of the National French safety stand down. And I realize that a lot of the work in the deep foundation industry is not so much trenches, but excavations. We're still talking working in or undergrade, in the dirt or undergrade. So uh, very important matters, uh, hazards to identify, corrective measures to uh, implement. So a good amount of wonderful information will be coming your way both this morning and tomorrow morning with a handful of speakers. Uh, including Rick Marshall, the safety director with the association. We have Dan Crawford, who is with DBM Contractors, and we have Matt Jannins, who is with Pacific Foundation. And we also have a handful of Oregon OSHA colleagues, colleagues that I work with here at Oregon OSHA to uh, present you an update uh, from Oregon OSHA tomorrow in the last hour, 11 to 12 is when we have that slated to provide the industry just a quick little update of what we have been up to here at Oregon OSHA. Again, my name is Craig Hamlin and I represent uh, the internal training side of Oregon OSHA and along with me is my colleague Chris Gillette who also represents the internal training side of Oregon OSHA. So as we kick this off, I would like to introduce Oregon OSHA's administrator, Mr. Michael Wood, who has been an awfully busy man these past 15, 16 months, but who's counting? Uh, but today we're not talking about the topic that he has been heavily involved in in the past 15 months or so. Today we're talking uh, deep foundation work. So Mr. Michael Wood, the administrator of Oregon OSHA. Michael? Thank you, Craig. And I just want to add my welcome to all the attendees. And I want to thank Rick for uh, for the presentation as well as all the other presenters. I do want to say that it, uh, you, you don't want to skip that hour from Oregon OSHA at the end of the seminar. Um, that's where we'll be announcing the proposal for a comprehensive ergonomics rule. And and you won't know whether or not I'm joking unless you uh, unless you show up. So um, I will, there'll be interesting things in the update, maybe not quite that interesting, but I hope that, uh, I hope that everybody will make good use of, uh, of both these sessions. And I, I just want to, uh, to say how much we appreciate this alliance. We appreciate all the various partnerships and collaborations that we have. It's part of how Oregon OSHA does business. Um, this one, you know, came out of some early discussions when we were actually investigating an, an injury that occurred on the job and we wanted to get a better handle on what the industry accepted work practices were. Um, and that built into, uh, into a further relationship that, uh, that, that has borne a lot of fruit. Um, what it hasn't yet borne is a lot of, uh, of live training um, we, we attempted our first live training session in January 2017, and uh, um, as, as Craig says, snowmageddon that day changed the plans. Um, <laughs> we don't get a lot of snow in, in, in Western Oregon, <laughs> but when we get it sometimes, it really kills um, travel opportunity. And so there were a lot of presenters who spent a lot of time on the road um, to not present and uh, we, we, we appreciate that um, that effort and we have been trying to uh, um, to to continue that effort we rescheduled that event um, we did set out to schedule live events uh, a year or so ago and this time instead of a major weather event we arranged a pandemic um, I'm not sure perhaps we should stop scheduling live events um, but we appreciate the the pivot and the effort to put this on. And there are there are limitations of the virtual platform, but there are some advantages as well. It uh, it makes it easier to attend. Um, you don't have to worry about the travel. You don't have to worry about the snow. Okay, that's not an issue today. But um, I just 
I, I hope that folks will take advantage. And I know that, that Rick is interested in making sure that people genuinely participate. Um, so do take the opportunity to give feedback along the way, um, to ask questions. Um, I, I know as a presenter myself that when you set up a training expecting audience interaction and then you, you don't get it, you, you have to start drawing on old family stories and um, all manner of things to, uh, to fill the time. So hopefully that we will uh, we'll do our part to, to help Rick and the other presenters out. Um, and then of course, I just want to acknowledge that, uh, that this year we appreciate Federal OSHA scheduling the trench stand down safety week, trench safety week, um, so that it matched our training. We, that, that was thoughtful of them. Uh, but I, this, it's, uh, it, one of the things that we've known for years and that everybody who works in or around this industry knows is that trenches really are the sort of classic snake in the grass type of risk. Everything around excavation has, has risks and significant risks. Um, it's important not to lose sight of those risks just because most of the time it goes okay. Um, and this really is one of those situations where the risks are real, the risks ultimately are death, um, but the probability in a lot of cases is relatively low. And unfortunately, that leads to a significant level of complacency. And of course, for the last year plus, we've all been pretty distracted in a lot of ways. Um, I think this is a good opportunity to reinforce and refocus. And I really appreciate everybody who took the efforts to put it together. And I hope, hope and expect and really know that it's going to be an excellent event. And so thank you all. And I'm not sure if I'm turning it back to you, Craig, or, or directly over to Rick. Please do, Michael. I'll take it from here. Thank you so much for your nice welcome and kind of piggybacking real quick on your comment about a bunch of players who have made this help make this happen, I should say. Uh, for all of you that are able to see the screen right now, that's a picture, of course, that came from our signing ceremony when the formal alliance was made between Oregon OSHA and the West Coast chapter of the Association of Drilled Shaft Contractors, the International Association of Foundation Drilling, and who you see right there in the middle is Becky Patterson, and Becky is the chapter administrator here for the West Coast chapter of ADSC IAFD. So, Becky, we cannot thank you enough for all of your hard work um, and coordination to um, uh, continue this effort to um, help Oregon OSHA staff along with our stakeholders on education um, surrounding this very key and important industry. All righty, Mr. Rick Marshall, I see your handsome face there. I think all you need to do is just click your share your screen icon there. If you see the sharing function there in the control panel. And let's see, I stopped sharing my screen. You should see your screen share. If you look at your control panel under sharing, I'm trying, but it's uh, not doing it. No worries. It's also that little monitor icon, if you see that before the sharing tab. I'm just gonna make sure that you're connected here. Yep, so you're still presenter. There you go. <laughs> hey, why don't you just leave it there and we can just gawk at that uh, fancy sports car. No, that's good. So, <laughs> so, so are you seeing my screen now? Yeah, it's no longer a fancy sports car though. It's an excavator, no. but take it away. Mr. Rick Marshall, safety director of the association. Thank you, Rick. All right. Oh. Thank you very much. All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're from. Appreciate the opportunity to work with Oregon OSHA once again. Uh, fortunately, it's not snowing at my house, so we're good to go. So we got a lot of topics to discover uh, between today and tomorrow. Some of them are directly excavation related, some of them are not. 
but much of the information that's being shared with you folks today and tomorrow was based on your input as what you wanted to learn about. So we're gonna start off talking about working platforms and operator certification. That's what I'm gonna talk about. And my co-presenters are gonna talk about other facts and figures that are related to the deep foundation industry this afternoon. And tomorrow we'll talk about some other topics that we'll get into. So my first topic is what is a working platform? And so the basic understanding of what it is and what it isn't. So let's just move right into it. Working platforms are a temporary geotechnical structure. So what does that actually mean? So it's the ground on which a foundation drill rig, a dedicated pile driver, a mobile crane, excavator, cement truck, car concrete truck, whatever that ground is, that is what the working platform is. So in technical sense, it's the geotechnical structure, existing subgrade that provides stable support for a piece of construction equipment. In this slide, it mentions the term track plant. I'll explain that here in the next slide. But it may consist of the existing subgrade. Oftentimes we, as a deep foundation contractor, roll up to a job site. And if the project looks suitable, we may just immediately start to work. Oftentimes that doesn't happen. And we may decide that it takes some ground improvements, something to make the ground better for us to operate safely from. So we may have to improve it using crushed stone, for example, maybe some geosynthetic fabric to beef up the subsurface, maybe the addition of better soil, maybe excavating some bad soil out and replacing it with good soil. Could be the use of steel uh, street plates, could be the use of wooden uh, timber mats, could be a combination of all of the above. So essentially what we're talking, that's what we're talking about for as far as a work platform is concerned. The term track plant is basically, oops, sorry about that. Any large piece of construction, either tracks or on wheels, it operates in a semi-static position. So you see in the background here that we have a dedicated drill rig. We have some ready mixed concrete trucks. We have a concrete pump truck and we have a mobile crane in the background. So the track plant doesn't necessarily just mean a foundation drill rig. It could apply to other machines, not necessarily to a dump truck, a skid steer, but other pieces of equipment that travel on a confined pathway throughout a job site. Modern equipment today is becoming more and more powerful as they've gained in size and in weight. Their centers of gravity have moved upwards and outwards making them slightly more unstable than older versions of long ago. Some machines are so large that they have a, just a static weight of upwards of 300 tons. These are physically large pieces of equipment. This is to keep up with the demands for deeper and larger diameter foundations, whether they be driven, uh, pile driven or drilled and necessary to take the higher load capacities that people are building. So it could be a bridge, it could be a building structure, be a lot of different things. So the industry and the environment has asked for larger pieces of equipment to install larger diameter and deeper foundation elements. On the left of the screen is a vintage 1960s drill rig. A lot of people in the 60s and late 50s purchased army surplus uh, trucks, put a manufacturer's drill rig on the back of it, and went to town drilling holes. As we've approached into the modern age here, the large Bauer machine here that you see, just to note, if you can see my cursor, this large blue section on top, that's one of the hoist winches. That hoist winch probably weighs as much as this entire truck mounted drill rig. So this is a physically large machine, weighs a lot. The stack of counterweights probably weighs as much or more than this drill rig does. So as you can kind of see, we've grown in size and in power. The DFI, that's the Deep Foundation Institute, they did a survey among some of their members wanting to know if in fact an unsafe working platform has ever had a negative effect on how you do business. A question was asked, have you experienced a safety or operational issue due to an insufficient working surface? And other replies, the largest amount was an inadequate 
they suffered from inadequate bearing or excessive rutting or overall instability. The other question that was asked over here is, have you ever suffered from an inadequate working surface? And look at the, the circle, the largest majority, almost everyone had some type of operational issue due to an unsafe working platform. So we'll talk a little bit more. So have there been consequences? There's always a consequence to a negative event. So we have delays is number one. Uh, if you're a contractor and you're listening, no one likes to be delayed. But unfortunately, a poor working surface, if no other reason, will delay you because it's definitely more difficult to move your equipment from a location to location on the job site itself. Some people suffered poor quality because the, the ground conditions were so poor, the machines were not being able to set up level, they installed a poor element, foundation elements. We had damage to equipment. And interestingly enough, if you've ever been to a construction site, while not everybody is always smiling and very happy, if the job site is really muddy, if it's tough to walk around, if it's difficult to get equipment around, everyone's morale usually goes down and they're not very happy campers when they're working on an unsafe well, working platform. So it's interesting, it not only affects the equipment, but it also affects the morale of the people working with that equipment. There's a lack of understanding as to who is responsible for a safe working platform. So even amongst ourselves as deep foundation contractors, we sometimes can't decide who is in who is in charge of what on when we roll up to a job site. But the importance of working platform capable supporting equipment, that should be a priority. And we'll talk about that as we go through here. There's much disagreement in our world as to who is responsible for it. We'll talk about some laws and some other issues that are already existing, but for the most part, the decision and historically has been either it's it's our responsibility as the deep foundation contractor, or we try to beg our way and maybe get the owner or general contractor to make us a, a much better area, somewhat better, even something better than knee deep mud hole. So let's progress here. You have a choice. We all have a choice. We can operate from the safe working platform on the left-hand side of the screen. The drill rig or the drill contractors that are in the audience would like go, we've never even seen a job site that looks like that. But this was made prior to this machine even coming on site. So someone thought about it before this machine came to be. This job site is not so good. And what you can't see is the main reason why this machine overturned was due to soft soils because the machine trammed or walked or traveled into a pre-existing utility trench that was installed unbeknownst to the foundation contractor. It was done over the weekend. It was poorly backfilled and it was not compacted. And this machine walked right over top of it and suffered an overturn. Uh, it may not look damaging to those who are unaccustomed, but there's a significant amount of damage done to this piece of equipment. No one was hurt, fortunately, but it did do a lot of damage to this machine and it had to be taken out of service. If you're a business owner, the first duty of business is to survive the, as a business, right? But the guiding principle of business economics is not the maximization of profit. Many people think we gotta have profit. We gotta have profit, go, 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 produce. But if you think about it, your profit can't overcome a loss. Loss is the greatest concern that you have as a business owner. When you suffer a loss, be it equipment, be it a human being, the cost associated with that is almost astronomical. So it's not just maximization of profits. It's maybe the greater term is the avoidance of loss. So risk, we all have risk in our in our entities and what we do, you know, you took a risk if you drove to work today, dealing with traffic. You took a risk if you drank your coffee too fast. But in our world in deep foundations, there's several different types of risks that are involved. We have contractual, financial, occupational, quality control, and there's some, unfortunately, there's some legal risks that we also take. Contractual issues, okay. Every contractor that's listening knows that the moment they show up to a job site, there's someone from the general contractor or the owner telling them, where have you been? You're behind schedule. 
So we start off a job almost always behind schedule. When we compound that with a poor working platform and we can't get our ready mix trucks on site, we have equipment that, gets, that literally gets stuck in the mud and we have to literally dig it out. And so it can move from point to point on a job site. We are behind schedule. This takes a lot of time. We can do significant damage trying to remove this vehicle from being stuck in the mud. We do we could do damage just on digging out this machine so it can travel from another place. So if we don't have a safe working platform, it affects schedule. So that's one thing in its favor. There's the financial risk, okay? If you're on this job site, you can immediately see that there's some problems here. This machine fell over and it fell over across high-speed rail tracks. So just think for a moment, what kind of risks are you looking at? We have damaged equipment. Uh, no one from the public was injured, but it was possible they could have been injured because this is an active high-speed rail. So the woulda, coulda, shoulda, could it have fallen over at the same time a train was there? Of course it could have. But it has the disrupted service. It's torn down catenary wires. That means there's no train traffic going through here. If you're a contractor and you ever work near a railroad of any form or kind, you'll know that the railroad does not like you to stop a train. So now we have service interruption. We have people who have to get from point A to point B. How do they get there if the train is their only way? Do we have to bus them? Do we have to provide public or private transportation? The liability meter just keeps running wide open here for every moment or minute this machine is laying across the tracks, let alone all the damage that it took, stuff this machine suffered, as well as how much it cost to write the machine and get it out of the way. So there's a large amount of money being spent here just to get this machine off the tracks and back in business. If you were sitting in this trailer doing your job site paperwork or calling for ready mix concrete or having a job meeting or whatever you were doing here, and someone might've mentioned, uh-oh, and then have this uh, foundation, this uh, dedicated pile driver fall over and take out your office trailer. The potential for human uh, incidents, interaction, so human interaction with a piece of equipment going over is pretty high. There could have been people on the other side of this machine. Fortunately, there was not, but it, it may have clipped this someone in this trailer. Uh, the operator is on this side by my cursor. So he or she probably wasn't injured. But again, the woulda, coulda, shoulda. Oftentimes when one of these pieces of equipment goes over, there's no way to predict which side it's gonna fall on. Uh, so it might be difficult to get out of its way. Uh, injury and fatalities. Unfortunately, our industry is the, is the number one or the most dangerous by industry. So it's a shame that we can't do some preventive measures. As you can see, Right here under by my cursor, you can see that this machine had a pretty good working platform, but it wasn't big enough and it walked off the platform. And you can obviously tell there's a significant difference between a good platform and a poor platform. <clears throat> this is an example of a pretty nice looking job site. The ground is dry, it's firm, it's well compacted. The machines are able to transport themselves back and forth the job site. This drill rig is able to set, the machine is sitting level, therefore it's much easier to drill a plumb shaft in this case. Uh, the contractor does a much better job when they're able to perform safely, when they can be productive and they're high, you know, have higher quality control. That's where your profit comes from. But if we had a loss because the machine turned over, if we had a loss due to scheduling, if we had a loss due to financial risks of an overturn, that profit just goes all away. Sometimes a large piece of equipment, if it falls over, does not fall inside the job site, but it can fall outside the job site. This particular incident, this is a motor vehicle where a man and a wife are driving by the job site, innocently enough, and this machine rolled over at the same time. It crushed and killed both of those people almost instantaneously. So if there's any attorneys out there in the room, obviously we have a legal risk here. And I can't even begin to predict how much money this is gonna to take to even remotely repair the damages. So it's interesting the amount of risk that we're willing to take 
to install a, a deep foundation. And yet one of the things we, we have little control over is a safe working platform until now. Mr. Wood talked a little bit about risk in his, in his uh, opening statements here. So one of the things he talked about was uh, probability. So in our world for deep foundation installation, we typically have high impact and high probability risks because we have large pieces of equipment. We have human beings interacting with that, that equipment. We move around, we're not static. We're not like a crane setting steel in one spot. Our cranes and our drill rigs and our pile drivers move all over the job site. So the risk is enhanced, but unfortunately, historically speaking, the working platform has been a very low priority until we have an equipment turnover. Then it becomes a high priority. Everyone is racing around trying to figure out what happened, why did it happen, whose fault is it? Well, we know had we had a safe working platform from the get-go, perhaps this incident would not have even taken place. So here in North America, we have two requirements, two legal requirements that specifically address working platforms. One of them is in the province of Ontario, Canada. And here in the States, we have the, in subpart CC for mobile cranes, we have uh, language in there that directly speaks to, in ocean speak, they call it ground conditions, but same, similar condition as working platforms. There's also two state plans that have a partial reference to safe working platforms, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. So this is a, an excerpt from the standards that take place in Ontario, Canada. It specifically talks about a rotary foundation drill rig. So that's in the title of the standard. And it requires, since July of 2016, that if a machine like this is going to be used on a given job site, that a professional engineer shall design a supporting surface. So before a job site even starts to take form, the winning uh, subcontractor has to submit to the uh, owner slash general contractor their equipment, the type of equipment, its weights, its ground bearing pressures, <clears throat> and then a working surface has to be engineered before that machine is even allowed to come on job site. The deep foundation contractor has to create a, a working plan, has to delineate all the areas that their machine is going to tram or travel on and the, how their sequence of events. But this is a, a legal requirement in the province of Ontario. Here in the States, this is the, in subpart CC, this is the requirement for mobile cranes. I highlighted the term or used here. It doesn't say that in the standard. Um, so this is federal OSHA and Washington and Oregon has, has adopted this language, I believe. So we're good to go here. The term or used. So a lot of people overlook that, especially even some of our ADSC members that are listening in here. So that means not only where the crane is assembled, but everywhere that crane walks, travels, does whatever, the ground conditions have to be sufficient to make sure that the machine is supported to the degree of level that the equipment manufacturer sets. So that's the burden of the controlling entity. So I'm sure there's a few contractors out there that are unaware that you have a federal law that backs you up for a safe working platform for mobile cranes. So hopefully you're using that to your advantage when you create your contract language. Remember too, that the, ent the controlling entity is supposed to identify known voids underground, known underground tanks, known utilities. It's not to say that you're not responsible for the call before you dig system. That's a whole nother level of risk mitigation. But this is all information that needs to be supplied in this case to the deep foundation contract. The two states, uh, Cal OSHA has requirements in their reinforcing steel and post-tensioning and concrete construction. And the state of Washington has similar, almost identical language in their similar subpart for reinforcing steel and post-tension. California says that the, under the site access, that the site for safe movement of derricks, cranes, trucks, and other necessary equipment. 
So this is applicable to the concrete and or reinforcing steel contractor. So for those of you who are a drill shaft contractor, and if you're pouring your own concrete, if you're state, if you're assembling and setting your own reinforcing steel cages, this would be applicable to you. So here again, you have a state requirement that says that the controlling entity has to provide you a means and methods for vehicular control and a safe platform to work from. The state of Washington has almost identical verbiage. So here again, the concrete and or reinforcing steel contractor has this as supplemental information to use in your contractual language. There are three ANSI slash ASSP. ASSP is American Society of Safety Professionals. So they team up and create the A10 standards. So there's three voluntary standards. ANSI standards are voluntary, not legal requirements. However, each one of these, which are specific to the deep foundation industry, you have one for pile driving, one for drilled shafts, and the third one for ground anchors and micropiles. They all have language in them that almost mimics identically the requirements for ground conditions for mobile cranes in the OSHA subpart CC. So here again, you have three recognized safety standards that all back up the, re the necessity for safe working platforms for deep foundation installation equipment. You have to wonder just how much pressure does a piece of equipment, such as in this case, a foundation drill rig, how much does it exert on the ground? If you look at these three uh, sketches here, the one on the extreme left is a machine just sitting there doing absolutely nothing. You'll notice though that the, the circle at the bottom of the, heading toward the bottom of the screen, that represents the mass and the, and the drill and the Kelly bar and the drill tool. So you can see in its normal configuration, there's more weight. The green shows how much pressure is being exerted when the machine is just sitting there. There's more weight being exerted to the front of the machine than there is to the rear of the machine. Most people might not think that's applicable, but a drill shaft contractor needs to understand that because as the machine turns or rotates on its axis, you'll notice that the bearing pressure increases as the machine swings over one of the uh, crawler tracks. Most people are unaware that when you change the machine's position, you change the machine's center of gravity, the ground pressure generally increases over the side or the, towards the rear. It's a lot of people don't understand this. So if you're a drill shaft contractor, when you're drilling a hole and you get a full auger full of material and you swing, you exert more pressure on the corner of the track. And then if you go to this one, the third one, on the side of the track, that's why your machine tends to lean over sometimes as you're spinning off. So you're exerting more ground pressure as the machine is moving, as it's drilling or driving a pot. If you have a mobile crane, this is from uh, ADSC uh, associate member Link Belt. If you go to their website and if you input the type of crane, its boom length, its load radius, the track width, how much your load weighs, how much counterweight the machine has. It'll run through a program and it will tell you based on the information that you inserted, how much ground pressure that machine will create or exert on the ground. So this is a pretty cool, it's a live diagram, this one in the bottom corner. You can swing the crane boom around and you can watch the pressures increase or decrease as the crane rotates around in its lifting circle. This is important information to know and a contractor needs to know this because they have to supply that information to the general contractor, the controlling entity per se, or in, in ANSI speak, it's the project constructor. Sometimes the manufacturer puts their bearing pressures within their operator's manual. This is from a company called Liebherr, it's a German contract company. Uh, not every manufacturer does this in their operator's manuals, but a drilled shaft or a pile driving contractor has to be able to have communication with their manufacturer and be able to determine what types of bearing pressures their equipment generates in the configuration that they're going to use them. Okay, so you have to know a lot about your equipment to be able to generate good information so you can give back to the owner, general contractor, controlling entity 
so a safe working platform can be created. Okay. Remember, we talked about it's not just for a foundation drill rig or a pile driver or a crane, it's for other pieces of equipment. It talks about the negative effects of a poor working platform. So you have a lack of productivity, you have difficulty in achieving high quality control, and you have worker injury or possible failure. Okay, so this is a concrete pump truck. The outriggers punch through the soil at no at inadequate bearing when the extended end that you can't see in the photograph came down the boom struck the individual that was holding the hose at the end of the pump and killed them almost instantly so because of the partial overturn that caused the boom to go down inside of this particular excavation and then it struck and killed that individual all as a result of this machine punching through the ground surface if you have equipment downtime, if you're a contractor, you know if that machine is not working, it's not making you any money. So if you have an overturn or even a partial overturn and it's not working, you're already losing money. If you have an actual overturn, you're gonna have to rent equipment if it's not already on site to write that piece of equipment. You're gonna have to make a plan, a safe working plan in order to prove to the owner or general contractor that you can safely write this machine. That may take a couple of days to create a plan that's accepted by everybody. You're going to have to rent tractor trailers if you don't have your own. You're going to have a crew that is now working on writing this machine as opposed to installing your deep foundation elements. So you're paying people to essentially do nothing except write this machine. They're not being productive as far as your job is concerned. People from your office, people from your insurance companies are going to have to travel to the job site to investigate to check out, to see what happened, to document. So there's going to be costs associated with that. You may have to have the manufacturer's representative come out and figure out a way to how to attach the rigging to the machine to properly write the machine so you don't damage it even further. And then I guarantee you, you're going to have a conversation in the trailer of the owner or general contractor trying to figure out who's at fault and who's paying for what. And that may take several days as well. In the meantime, you are not productive. You have other expenses here. You have the cost of repairing damaged equipment. You have, maybe you have to rent equipment to replace the damaged equipment. Uh, those of you in this business know that there's not a lot of rental equipment out there. Everyone's busy. So the, your ability to rent a machine to do the work that you're trying to do may be difficult. You may have some downtime waiting on a rental piece of equipment. It's expensive to repair a piece of equipment like this. This is a, I don't know, half a million dollar piece of equipment here. Some, most of them are made outside of the United States. So just getting parts here sometimes is difficult to get them back into the States if they're not already here. There's a high cost. If it's sitting on an angle like this one is, it may be leaking uh, diesel fuel. It may be leaking hydraulic oil. So there's gonna be a cleanup involved there. It may be something very simple, or you may have a major spill because you've punctured a fuel tank or a hydraulic reservoir. Maybe you tore a, a hose off. And I'm pretty sure the insurance premiums for your liability insurance are gonna go up because you had an overturned incident. Insurance is expensive. And just like for your house or your car, you keep having incidents, your rates are going to go up. If you're a contractor and you can't even get your equipment that's on a trailer to the job site to unload it, you're behind schedule. So how is that gonna deal? How are you gonna deal with that? You can't even get off the street onto the job site because no one has provided you access to the job. So here you are stuck in the mud. If you had had a pre-construction meeting and discussed safe working platforms, not only in the work area, but for your loading, unloading, assembly and disassembly areas, you'd be miles ahead instead of waiting for someone to get you out of the mud. Again, same picture we saw before, productivity. How productive are you gonna be if your machine is stuck in the mud over and over and over again? This is maybe not so, well, it is important for a crawler or a track machine, but if you have a rubber tire drill rig and it's stuck in the mud, you can do some significant damages to them by trying to pull them out of the mud. Stuck ready mix truck, okay, not good. How are you gonna pour concrete? So in an ideal world, we have a beautiful pad, 
we can drive our ready mix truck right up to the drill shaft and fill it nice neat very productive high quality you can see what's going on you have people observing people are standing in the dry uh, safe sound operation here all because of a safe work platform for the installation of tieback anchors, what we call, we're gonna talk about a little bit more about that tomorrow. These are two pretty nasty looking job sites here. The one on the right, this is an excavation. So this is a form of engineered shoring and we're installing a tieback anchor to keep this wall from falling over. But if you notice, this is a pretty nasty looking job site. So not only is it slow down productivity, might impact quality control because this rig may sink in the mud and not drill appropriately at the angle that's designed. But it's extremely difficult for the workers to walk up and either add or remove sections of drilling steel here because if you notice, there's a piece of a pallet board there just to keep this individual out of the mud. So this we allowed this to happen as a deep foundation contractor. We did not have a decent pre-construction meeting. We did not explain our needs correctly. We did not request a proper working surface to operate from. This is a slow process and we have allowed that to happen. We should be ashamed. Here, if you're a safety person listening, you're already noticing this is possible damaged knees, damaged back, shoulder injuries, slip, trip, and fall. The uh, hazards go on and on and on here. And realistically, how productive do you think these people are gonna be if they have to fight this kind of mud just to exchange pieces of drill steel? Again, you have all the inadequacies of a poor working surface working against you, not for you. Great looking place to assemble or disassemble. Okay, we can drive a tractor trailer here. We can expedite the unloading of this machine, get rid of the tractor, drop the gooseneck, walk right off. This machine is almost ready to go into action in a very short period of time. This machine requires some assembly. So if you've ever put a machine like this together, whether it be a drill rig, a dedicated powder, or even a crane for that matter, some newer style equipment has the ability to do self erect. So this machine can pull its counterweight up. Pretty cool. However, if this machine is not sitting level, if it's unstable, if it has a soft spot in here, this counterweight's going to come up crooked or cockeyed. It could possibly do damage to the hydraulic cylinders that are pulling it up. Uh, those are extremely expensive. It takes a lot more time because the pins that lock it in place are not going to be able to be inserted correctly because they're going to be out of alignment. So this is going to take time and you can do possible damage to your piece of equipment simply because you have a poor working surface to operate from. This one's not too bad, but I've seen far worse. And all it does is eat up your ability to be productive. And there is a safety issue there. So you gotta be careful with people putting machinery either together or taking it apart. As a drill shaft contractor, more than likely you're gonna be somehow handling reinforcing steel cages to further reinforce the concrete element that's in your shaft. Most of the time they're either delivered on site to the site already pre-made or sometimes on, like on the left, they're made and manufactured on site. Either way, how do you get them to the actual drilled shaft location? If you have a bad looking job site and you can't transport, this is a rather large cage. It's obviously at least 50 or 60, 75 feet long somewhere. It's probably six to eight, maybe 10 feet in diameter. How are you going to get something that large from where it was assembled over to where it actually gets installed? Yes, you may have a large crane here, but you still have to walk the crane to the to the drilled shaft site area. A safe working platform virtually eliminates all the problems that could be associated, all the hazards with not only putting a cage together, but then getting it to the site and then lifting it from this horizontal position into a vertical position, which we're gonna talk about hopefully this afternoon. So the importance of that safe working platform, key to the safe work. All right, so let's talk about something we never wanna talk about. 
in the event we actually have an accident, I'm looking at these nice uh, rescue trucks, these fire trucks and whatnot. So if you call 911 and you, and you actually get a response and the rescue fire rescue shows up, I'm pretty sure it's a safe bet that they're not gonna take this really expensive, dedicated pieces of equipment and drive it down into an ugly looking job site like that. So the only alternative for them to get rescue people into this job site is for them to walk. Well, how are they gonna get to the job site? Yes, there's a ladder here, but you're probably going to, you can't take rescue equipment down a ladder. That would be unsafe. So they sort of kind of built this ramp to get down in there. So there was no real plan. There was no real safe platform to get not only the contractor's equipment in and out of here, the excavating contractor's equipment in and out of here in a productive, safe manner, but what happens in the event that we had an actual injury or a fatality? How are we going to get fire rescue people down there? So is that, that's a, yet another level of liability, so to speak, that a safe working platform can possibly eliminate. Not all working platforms require an engineered uh, system. So this is geotextile fabric. They excavated out poor material. They backfilled it with sand and some gravel. Not everybody needs to do that. There are some jobs that need it, but not every job needs to do that. It could be something as simple as this. We have this dedicated power driver sitting on crane mats. We have this dedicated drill rig sitting on some compacted gravel that was just trucked in, bladed off, and they were able to run the machine over a little bit, and voila, we have a an a safe working platform for this particular drill shaft. We have a safe working platform for the installation of this driven pile. We may have to do this over and over, but maybe not. It just depends on the job site. So you don't need a true scientifically engineered platform. It could be something as simple as this. We need something, however. Our industry, our deep foundation industry, we have three major players in our deep foundation industry. We have ADSC, which I represent, Association of Drill Shaft Contractors. We have DFI, that's a Deep Foundation Institute. And third is PDCA, that's the Power Driving Contractors Association. We three work together to create this guidance document, Recommended Industry Practices for Safe Working Platforms. Um, it's available on our ADSC website and all three of these websites for that matter. I will send Craig a link to it so all the audience participants here can have a link to this document if you don't already have it. So what it is, is a document worked on by industry professionals. We had safety people, we had engineers, we had contractor input, we had a lot of input from all different areas of the deep foundation industry. What it does is the recognition, it recognizes that we need proper analysis for a working platform before we even start work and that's done by controlling entities and acknowledgement of their responsibilities for such a task there's common appropriate language that that you can use for, in this document for your own contractual language should you decide to do so and we believe that enforcement because some of the requirements in this document are not legal requirements because many of them are based on ANSI standards because it's not particular to a mobile crane um that the industry will self-police that's one of the reasons why we did that it's one of the beauties of these three associations we tend to all self-police what we do we anticipate that contractors equipment suppliers will fully work together to generate actual ground pressure uh, figures that their equipment used in the configuration that they will this that they're going to use them in will be good information that we can in turn give to the controlling entity, the project constructor, whomever, to make sure that we have good information to work from so a platform can be made, okay? If you follow risk management and you understand the thought of um, prevention through design, NIOSH has a, has a big section of their webpage devoted to prevention through design. OSHA talked a little bit about what they call design for construction safety. They intertwine, they say the same particular thing. But we look, we as ADSC look at this 
document that we collectively created as a risk management tool because it provides a framework for a responsible program for not only creating but maintaining job site safety. Okay? It follows the practice of prevention through design during pre-construction phase of a project. So most of the time safety is a reactive thought process, but here we're trying to be proactive and doing it before construction even takes place. And of course, because we have safety people on board, safety is without a doubt the most crucial investment we can make. It's not what it costs, it's what it saves, okay? So we know that a, a working platform is a risk management tool. So in the document, this is a, a fault tree that you can use to try to figure out if you do or do not need an engineered platform, or if you can just take what you got and work with it safely. There's a thought process that go through there, like we discussed earlier. But one of the people or entities that we're focusing on is not only the engineering community and design, but we also are focusing on the insurance community. Many times, uh, large projects have what's are either self-insured or they have a contractor insurance program. These stress project safety. Well, here's a risk management tool talking about safe working platforms that the insurance company we hope will latch on to and make this a requirement for a job because of all the risk mitigation processes that it entails because no one wants to see a machine overturn. It's just not good for business, no matter who you are or what you do, okay? The role of risk management is you manage risk in order to keep failure from being successful. Unfortunately, in this particular photo, we did not manage the risk of a soft spot right here. No one paid attention, no one thought it's necessary. And we have a machine turned over, and if you notice, it's right across the lanes of an active roadway. Again, no one was injured here. However, the woulda, coulda, shoulda is very present. Risk management strategies are helpful in bringing down premium costs. So you as a contractor listening, if you adopt this risk management tool in your corporate thought process, you might be able to negotiate lower premium costs for your liability insurance, maybe even your workers' comp insurance, because you've adopted a risk management tool. Okay, your insurance company likes it when you do that. If you incorporate this into your overall safety plan, you possibly may be a candidate for a reduced premium. A safe working platform. So it's not just, understand one thing, it's not just for a deep foundation contractor. If the working platform is designed properly and it's maintained throughout the deep foundation installation process, that platform will remain for the entire duration of the project. So not only is the deep foundation contractor able to use it successfully, but so will every other subcontractor following be able to make use of that safe working platform. So it's not just for the deep foundation contractor, it's for everyone that follows. So we have a good job site from the start, not as it has to go on. Like many things in our industry, <clears throat> It takes a collective action to make something happen. We don't have a legal requirement that backs up the need for a safe working platform for a dedicated drill rig. We have one for cranes. We have one for dedicated pile drivers, but we don't have one for a dedicated drill rig, which is this picture here. So we as contractors, we as Oregon OSHA compliance and consultation members here that are listening, this is a concerted collective effort. So when you roll up onto a job site, either doing consultation or maybe even a compliance inspection, one of the questions I'm hoping after you've learned and listened to this for a little bit is whether or not someone has thought out whether or not a safe working platform for the project is necessary or one for localized platforms for specific areas of the job site. If anyone has even taken a look at that, if nothing else, in my opinion, if there's not a thought process, if there's not uh, some genuine activity that's taking place here in a proactive sense, and there is an incident that could be cited perhaps under the general duty clause because there's so much information available out there, 
This document is now out there. There's three ANSI standards that, that address it, that perhaps the industry should have known better. So it's a potential general duty clause for not paying attention to what your industry says is what we should be doing. So that's my portion on safe working platforms. Craig, I don't know if anyone's asked a question, I'd be happy to answer. Oh my goodness, Rick. Funny you mentioned that. I do have a couple of questions in the queue and I'm not gonna mention Brandy's name, but I can always count on her with asking very good questions. So I do have a few coming right at you here, Rick. And for all others on the uh, webinar right now, I think I failed to mention at the onset, if you do have a question, please submit that through chat uh, in your control panel. And uh, Chris and I will do our darndest uh, monitoring the chat and ask questions that are submitted through the chat for our presenters. Uh, first question, Rick, do contractors in this industry have access to any type of registry of when utilities or government entities create these utility trenches? A system similar to call before you dig, is there a resource to proactively attempt to identify these poorly filled voids? Well, to first part of the question, yeah, we all have access to the 811 call system depending on where you are, each state has their own interpretation of that. So every state that I'm aware of has a legal requirement that even if you're the only contractor or either you're the 110th contractor that's going to uh, excavate on a job site, you must call and go through the protocols of the utility locate. So that's one thing. So we know in advance of the existing utility, but what we sometimes are unaware of is when a contractor on the job site installs a utility unbeknownst to everyone else, maybe they do it over the weekend, maybe they do it out of sequence, and because of a lack of communication on the job site, no one else knew about it. So in that picture that I showed, that's what happened there. So not a registry per se, but we all suffer from a lack of communication on a given job site, I think, there's probably some heads nodding at the moment. So we need to do a better job internally and externally to ask questions. What happened over the weekend? Is there anything took place that I need to know about? Because here's my plan for the day. This is where I'm gonna be working. Is there something there that I need to be aware of? That's a pretty good question. And a follow-up to that question, Rick. How does the contractor attempt to identify these boys? Uh, for example, laser graphing, simple visual assessment, what should we consider due diligence for a good operation of identifying these voids? So if you go through the, the utility locate process, they tend to only identify stuff that's on public property. So utilities that, that come into the job site. A prudent contractor needs to hire a, 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 a private locate service to either come in and, and do the normal utility locate, or if we suspect, because we have historical information on the project, that it was a industrial area, a chemical plant, a gas station, or whatever, and then we sort of can suspect whether or not there are buried tanks or electrical vaults or something like that. And perhaps by the use of ground penetrating radar or other, maybe some, what we, in the industry called potholing, where you actually excavate to make sure that there either is or isn't a utility or a buried utility vault or some kind of tank or whatever. You do that carefully, obviously. So there's some methods out there. It's not a perfect world. And if anyone else has a, a better answer to that, I'm more than welcome to entertain it. So unfortunately, there's a lot of risk involved here. We're penetrating the soil in the unknown. So risk is the middle name of a deep foundation insulation contractor. All righty, sir. When these rigs suffer a collapse or turnover, are they typically a complete loss? I would imagine with the weights involved, the frames and structural aspects of these components are impacted. Can segments be reintroduced into service after a tip over or toppling? And what is the process? The, it's best to get the manufacturer involved. Some of the damage can be repaired. Some new components can be retrofitted to older pieces of equipment. 
uh, depending on the age and the number of engine hours and whatnot, your insurance carrier may deem the overturn accident a total loss because of the value of the piece of equipment. So there's lots of ways to skin this cat, but there's many entities out there that can repair correctly, usually the manufacturer or a, or a known contractor of the manufacturer to repair the machine correctly so it can be returned to safe operation. So there, there are methods to fix it up, so to speak. All righty. Well, Portland, along with many other areas around the country, have hills. And we have a good amount of hills over just a little west of me. Um, how do contractors deal with inclines when attempting to create a solid working platform? Do most of these companies have a professional engineer on staff? And just curiosity here, how much inclines really create additional hazards to the employees in this profession? Inclines are not friendly to what we do, obviously. Most manufacturers will tell you, they will give you prescriptive, not to exceed angles of inclination for their machines to safely operate from. That will be right in the operator's manual. So knowing that ahead of time, the contractor, the deep foundation contractor needs to have a conversation with the controlling entity, whether it be a general contractor, the owner, maybe the state perhaps, to determine how we can best address using a given piece of equipment, the inclination of the ground. Slopes are not good. Unfortunately, there's been several pieces of large equipment that have fallen over hillsides as they are trying to install uh, or repair a landslide that has happened on both coasts, not just the West Coast. So it's a it's a tricky thing to do. So you have to be aware of what your equipment can do. But in this case, more importantly, you need to be aware of what your machine and equipment cannot do and how it can't perform safely. And you have to stay within those parameters. So it's a, again, it's a joint effort. And the more you know ahead of time, the better off you're going to be to make sure you don't have this problem during the construction of the job. Well, and speaking of a joint effort, as we slide back over to your piece there, talking about the standards, you mentioned the ANSI standard, um, ASSP, um, uh, and the, the, well, the ANSI standard written by ASSP and your uh, partners in this industry. Um, in your professional opinion, which standard is the generally accepted good engineering practice for this industry? Which ones would you prefer folks like OSHA refer to when assessing an operation relating to safe working platforms? Realistically, all three. There's not, there's not a lot of quote unquote engineering information in either of the documents, but there's lots of generalities. There's lots of facts that people can can act upon and understand. So because I participated in all three of the ANSI standards, I'm proud of the fact that they were written for the people that do the work. So an average construction worker can pick up one of those ANSI standards and read, and more importantly, understand what the requirements uh, indicate. So that is a true benefit of a, of a standard written by industry. So I'm pretty proud of that. So to your point, they're all good reference documents. And because our industry and the people, you know, we, we need to be aware of what our industry is, has told us we should be doing. So shame on us if we're not complying with our own industry safety standards. And that uh, guidance document that you had uh, forwarded me there some time ago, uh, that was shared, and I will make darn sure that it is shared again and made available uh, uh, Great. to uh, folks who, who are certainly interested in that. How often does perception of a need to maintain on schedule influence a decision to go forward with a project without adequate work platforms? I suspect all the contractors listening are going, are you kidding me? The demand for productivity is pretty high, unfortunately. You've seen it in, in every segment of the construction industry, not just us. Uh, unfortunately, that drives some 
contractors to perform unsafely. I'm hoping that at least the ADSE contractors listening understand that, but act in a more prudent fashion and work safely because when you work safely, you work smarter. And it's, it's a tough sell, but I think the safety people on board here will, will nod their head and say, if you do your job safely, you will in fact be more productive and you will have greater quality control over the finished product. Because if you work safely, you have to have a plan. And when you plan your work, you usually are successful in its completion. Well said, sir. I have two more, because I know we're getting into our break time and then uh, anticipating Mr. Crawford. Um, how often would operator manuals for these pieces of equipment have requirements, either specific or general, regarding evaluation of the working platform? It's, it's, they, they may make a very generalistic statement. They're more, they're more concerned with telling you uh, slope angles and what not to exceed. So that's the language that you're going to see. They're not going to tell you that you have to have a, a bearing surface that is, will resist this amount of ground pressure. Most of them do not say that. It's, it's inferred, but you'll not see it in print. Alrighty, and last question here. What type of equipment operator training or certification is required and are associated documents available on site? Okay, that's a good question because that's kind of like the next topic here, if I have time to talk about it. So for a, a foundation drill rig, so you OSHA people on board understand that the employer is responsible to educate and train employees for the task that they're about to perform. So operator training for any piece of equipment is a, is a required uh, need. Specifically, contractors can engage the manufacturer and get uh, more specific information about that particular piece of equipment. That's always a suggested thing to do. ADSC, as an association, we put on what's called drill rig operator school. In fact, we have one coming up in October where we take students from ADSC members and we let them operate uh, at least five different types of drill rigs for half a day. And then the other half a day, they're in classroom sessions learning about safety, learning about concrete insulation, learning about how to install, in this case, a drilled shaft. We also have one for anchor and micropile insulation. So there's a fair amount of educational material out there. Uh, there's other privateers that do it as well. So, but the employer has to make sure that whoever is operating a piece of equipment like the one on the slide here knows and understands what the machine can and more importantly, what it cannot do, especially in preventing an overturn. Very good, very good answers to those questions, sir, and very good presentation to start off the series of two morning webinars. Now, I've always been the believer of one who creates an agenda has authority to modify said agenda. And I know I did have a break time between 9.30 and 9.45 and Mr. Dan Crawford uh, starting his presentation at 9.45. I have 9.40, but I think the information that was shared was important and crucial. So what I would like to offer is a 10 minute break if we can reconvene at 9.50, we will have Mr. Dan Crawford join us and talk more about risks and solutions when it comes to this type of work. So we'll reconvene at 9.50 Pacific time. I do know I have folks all across the country here. So 10 minutes from now, 10 minutes before the hour, we will reconvene. Thank you, Rick. We'll see you back. Thank you. We are uh, ready. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Craig and uh, Rick, for your starting of this uh, presentation there this morning. Hopefully, I can follow up and be as good as you guys were. So, we're going to be talking well, about. Dan, a if I, if, oh. 
if I may, real quick, we just appreciate the time you are taking for us, taking time out of your busy schedule and presenting the second part here of this morning session. So everybody, welcome back. And I did want to make one quick statement we didn't quite get to, and it's on my end, uh, Rick's portion covering the NCCCO qualification. So Rick will certainly include that information in his portion tomorrow. And all of these segments of the two morning webinars are being recorded for later viewing. And we will also make sure that any accompanying uh, materials that are shared throughout these morning webinars are also posted and made available as well. So who we have now, of course, in high viz and was donning the hard hat a few seconds ago, but took it off so we can see his handsome face there. Mr. Dan Crawford, everybody. Thanks so much, Craig. I appreciate it. And uh, again, I've decided to kind of follow Rick Marshall's lead there, so I dyed my hair gray so I would look like I'm mature and knowledgeable. So anyway, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, I hope this doesn't bother you guys here, but initially the thought was is that we were going to talk about pre-task plans and how they can be used to address changing site conditions, and then I was going to show a number of issues that we've seen on uh, various job sites. But there is no silver bullet, other than Rick Marshall and myself, uh, for handling safety. And so there's a variety of tools that we use. And so I'm going to go through, if you will, several tools that we have to create the safety culture, and then best practices with those, and then we'll see where best practices were not implemented. Um, something that Rick alluded to that I want to emphasize for those of you that haven't been out to a job site where there is deep foundation drilling going on is that it is, uh, in the words of my dad, when we had pets in our house, it's a dog's breakfast. And that is that you've got multiple entities that are out at the site doing their tasks. And so you're all having to play in the same sandbox. And I think with that image that we have right now, you can see that there might be some people that uh, take safety very serious and others that may not. And you have to account for that in your work. So it's good that everyone gets on the same sheet of paper, if you will, every morning and coordinates their part of the job that they're doing. And they're all aware of the potential hazards that their task can create. So here um, at DBM, and I think this would probably be the case for a lot of other uh, drilling subcontractors, these are some of the tools that we use to create uh, safe conditions. So the first one that you can see is a, a toolbox meeting. And in the case, uh, we usually do this uh, once a week, the toolbox meeting, but we have the morning safety meeting every morning. And that's usually in combination with what we call a stretch and flex. But if you look at that toolbox safety meeting, we've got uh, in the top part there, at least with us, you can see all of the different types of hazards that we will discuss. And then we and talk I about... Interrupt, yep. we, mm -hmm. we don't have that slide showing, so try advancing that slide again, sir. Okay. We still, we still uh, see your cover slide there. Okay. Geez, that's weird. How about that? There we go. Perfect. Okay. Very good. Sorry, I was on the wrong side there. Um, anyway, you can see from this uh, toolbox safety meeting there, we have the uh, principles, if you will, that we cover every day that are typical problems that might arise during the job. We then review the job site inspection and any findings that are there. We look at any near misses or accidents, discuss those. Uh, we will cover basically the topic du jour for the week. And then we'll get into basically suggestions and comments from the individual workers, actions to take or to correct those problems, and then we'll have a, a weekly safety nomination. So right away, we're starting our morning, if you will, about some of the potential issues that could arise in association with our tasks, and we're recognizing safe behavior. That kind of sets the mindset. But as Rick said, uh, this work is a three-legged stool. You've got efficiency, you have quality, and you have safety. And as Rick alluded to, um, no one takes priority over the other. But if you do practice things safely, you become much more effective 
and the quality becomes better as you're more effective. Um, so they basically go hand in hand, but one is not greater than the other. So this thing about safety first, I kind of struggle with a little bit because we want to have them, if you will, all blending together as, as a team. And uh, the safety meeting that we have in the morning is an opportunity for people to basically detail what they've seen yesterday <laughs> or the day before and bring that to the attention so we can all be aware. Uh, second thing that we do there, and you can see is the job site inspections are extremely critical in identifying, if you will, the hazards, as well as the equipment. Rick alluded to a little bit about that, but you know, if your equipment isn't functioning well or you got problems, that shuts it down, but it can also present safety hazards. So we have that being done every day. Audits are great. And in our case there, I'm just showing an example of a third party that was came out. Uh, the two of our job sites, this is done by the AGC, but you can have other third-party entities do it. And this is a good, um, how do I say, it's a good barometer, if you will, independent barometer to show how you are performing at the site. And it's always good to get good feedback. In this case, we nailed it uh, with a 200% uh, scores there, which kind of gave me a comfort to know that someone else besides myself thought that we are doing a good job. And uh, the other thing that's also critical is to review any near misses. Uh, those that fail to learn the lessons from history are doomed to repeat them. And a near miss can help to maybe steer or correct, if you will, um, any incidents that could have led to a, um, an accident. And so we discuss that at length. And most importantly, what are the corrective measures for doing that? This is something that we, we believe that a lot of people are visual and we like to have reminders. So we have something on our sites that are called has rec boards. And during that, uh, throughout the week, um, we identify, if you will, the tasks that we're doing or the incidents that we've seen, and we talk about the directives we're gonna do and the corrective measures. And this serves as a reminder, if you will, of anything that is basically discussed in our meeting or during the day, we put down on the board and that, serves to help remind people about some of the potential hazards that are present on this job, because each job presents its own thing. Another one there is this visually, um, I, I don't know if Rick agrees with this, but I think a well-organized site is a safe site. And it starts uh, in the crew shack, <laughs> as well as on the job site where you gather and where you work. And as you can see, this is actually a crew shack uh, at one of our sites there, and they've created a table where the three task plans are prepared. We have the JHA or the site-specific plan there that's open, and then we have certain uh, visuals for things that have come up in the past. There's a picture on the wall on the right there that has to do with uh, silica and the different tasks and the PPE that's required for that. We have a chainsaw diagram we put in to basically help to avoid potential uh, saw incidents. And we also have, obviously, the labor and industries and the labor posters there. But basically, everything's in order there, so it's a good reminder for them. And then with our uh, different signs that we have out there, everyone sees that we are thinking safety as part of our job. And it's just a great way, if you will, to reinforce what we speak about. Um, one of the first things that, uh, comes into play with basically drill rigs. When you're downtown or when you're in areas that already got a lot of electrical lines, is how do you address the uh, power line issues that occur? And that's from the start, before you start the job, is you map out where those lines might be. You I find out from the power company what the voltage is. You find out the distances in which you're going to be working. And you take the appropriate setbacks. Uh, Two of the things that we do in our jobs is that we have the lines flagged, both pores, um, uh, at, at height and on the ground. At height, you can see the uh, lines that are flagged. And uh, at, on the ground, we'll have basically markations with cones or paint and then a spotter. And that basically indicates how close we're getting to it and whether our mass is beneath that. But that's essential in avoiding power lines. On that picture on the left, that was a temporary power. You can see up on the platform there, they had temporary power junction boxes that were brought on. So we had a wooden, if you will, casing.
that help to protect that from the base as well as having the flagging there. And you can see that there isn't a lot of space on these job sites. So you need to be able to give sufficient space, if you will, that still allows you to get the job done. On the right, a little bit more of the same thing there is you have to be cognizant. In this case, the drill rig is actually doing some of the work that a crane can also do, and that is it's picking up and loading piles into the open hole, and you can see that on the left side. Okay, I have to show this because more often than not, we have underground utilities as an issue than overhead. And uh, one of the things we do is we'll map ahead of time what's published, what's printed uh, about the utilities around the site. And I don't know if you've heard the statement, trust but verify, <laughs> but that's a key thing that you have to do out there is you'll have the power company come out and mark what they have in the right of way. But then there's the issue sometimes when it goes onto the property where their demarcation ends. And so we do pothole. You can see an example of a uh, truck there, which basically uses high jetted spray to uh, remove the soil. And in the uh, middle picture, I thought this was kind of interesting. One of our sites is what's marked in orange was supposed to be where the underground utility line went. And it was supposed to be one line. And uh, you can see from the picture there that um, it was supposed to cross to the right. And uh, we, don't see the, we don't see the line there. We see the line that's uh, basically outside of the sidewalk there. And you can see another very dark image, but that's the line that was supposed to cross. The bottom line is this one that's in white that you see in the hole, that wasn't marked before. So we found another parallel line, lo and behold, as part of that. That's why potholing is critical, because more often than not, you have abandoned lines or ones that maybe didn't ever make it to the drawing. You've got to identify all those. Potholing is a great way to do it. Um, and then the question arises, well, what do you do when you encounter uh, lines that are crossing there. And what we have here in the picture on the right is an example of a design build adjustment. So you can see that we had two orange stakes, which is where the piles are supposed to go. Once we uncovered that with our potholing, we backed off so it's at the top of the screen there. You can see where we started to put in our pile. We gave ourselves enough distance, but we also had to have the engineers confirm that by offsetting it by said distance wasn't gonna change in terms of the capability of the support. But it's really critical that you have that ability to make the adjustment as things occur in the field. And uh, again, potholing and working with your engineer are critical steps in that process. We often talk about swing radius. In fact, uh, one of the cases that I'll be showing a little bit later on, later on deals with the swing radius, but there's several ways you can do that. And what you're trying to make sure of is that where the crane or where the drill rig is operating is not something that everyone approaches commonly without uh, putting on high alert. So we delineate it there. There's several ways you can see in the, in this case here, we've got cones and we have these extender bars, which are great because they hold up a little bit better than caution tape in the wind. And then uh, you guys probably heard of the uh, chop zone in Seattle that we had last summer. Well, the guys kind of took that to heart and they created, instead of a swing radius zone, they had what's called a Dan free zone. And so I was not supposed to go within that without proper permission. You can have fun with safety. And I thought the guys did a nice job of uh, playing off of that there in their delineation. This is another case there of uh, what we call controlled access zone. Uh, same thing, you've got your caution tape, you've got your cones, and it gives you enough of a swath of uh, area there where the crane can move about and no one enters into that until they have confirmation, if you will, from the operator or the oiler, which is the one that helps with the rigging and directing the crane as they're picking into the excavation. Uh, at some of our sites, we have to put signs on that as well. And you can see on the right picture there where we've got not only our rope and our cones, but we also have our signs. And in this case here, you have to call ahead if you're gonna go in and let them know you're entering that zone. So uh, each site has different requirements, if you will, for how one gets in there to uh, interact with the operator. 
Here's some other uh, cases, uh, yellow bars or uh, work zone barricades. Um, you can see that uh, some of these sites have fall offs uh, from uh, gaps where maybe the uh, uh, lagging boards have not had the uh, CDF filled in and there's drop offs and you want to prevent people from walking in that area and possibly falling in. Uh, for indoor work, uh, where we are putting holes inside the, <clears throat> the flooring there, greater than six feet, uh, we have illuminated uh, lighting there to show, uh, to prevent slip, trip, and falls. We have our caution tape and our cones, and we have the typical plywood boards marked with either hole or cover. But clearly you can see that uh, when you're working with others, you don't want the looky-loos of the other people that might be curious walking into your work area. So you want to delineate that as a uh, indication that this is only for those workers that are doing the task. Silica. So if you look at table one, a lot of the work that we do was not listed in that. And so you have to come up with your own plans, if you will. And so a couple of years ago when started, we ended up doing monitoring uh, of our workers for our types of tasks that we do in the uh, uh, deep foundation drilling. And a couple of them were right here in these pictures of where we generate, if you will, uh, silica dust. Uh, the first one is a fine mist, if you will, uh, shot creep found out that the shock creep contains about 20%. And so um, because it comes on wet and it's supposed to dry to help to provide that uh, foundational wall, uh, we use respirators as part of that. Interesting thing that we found out with silica and uh, the shock creep is that there's called a rebound effect. So you might think that the guy that's most exposed is the one that is applying the shock creep here. Turns out it's those that are along the wall that are either dragging the hose to help them get to the point or the ones we call them the rod man that they scrape the wall to, to smooth it out and to take off the excess. They're actually also prone to inhalation of silica dust. So we either have them stay out of the cloud, if you will, or they're wearing a respirator as well. But just remember, it's not just the nozzleman that is affected by the application of the shot creep. Uh, the second thing is when we're uh, breaking bags or mixing with water and concrete to develop our CDF there, um, some of these in the mixing tank, the lid isn't quite as secure. And as a result, you have uh, dust that will occur. And so our operators wear masks. And you can see this one's clearly heavily used. It's an N95. And you can see just from him wearing that throughout the day, which, by the way, he does have to change uh, if it gets too uh, clogged. But you can see the dust has collected where he's breathing there. It's doing a good job, but that just goes to show you that what may seem like innocent dust <laughs> is actually around him as he does that work there, and it is collecting on the mask. Uh, the third thing is um, where maybe we're scraping or chipping bays. That's to create a smooth surface where we can put our lagging boards. In this case here, we use the application of water to help to suppress the dust. So there's a number of engineering controls or uh, PPE that you can use, but we make sure our workers know what our tasks are and what the engineering controls or PPE is that they use for that job, and that's essential so we don't have to deal with silicosis or kidney failure down the road. Um, here in the Northwest, water bodies, rivers, lakes, streams, uh, can often be close by or we can have storm drains that lead uh, to those water bodies. And so secondary containment, at least up here in the uh, Seattle area, Seattle, Bellevue, Redmond, it's essential that you maintain any uh, liquids that might come from a leak, a spill, or whatever. And so you can see here with our various uh, storage areas there that we're using secondary containment. In the case of the silo there, we've got basically a wooden border, uh, lagging boards with plastic we put around to contain any spillage uh, with our storage cabinet, which has diesel and gas. Uh, sometimes when they're pouring that fluid out, it can leak. And so we've got a cap, we've got the secondary containment for that. And the same thing for our desk. So anything that can possibly hit the ground, whether it's mobile equipment or stationary, uh, where we're near those water bodies, we will put in secondary containment as a best practice. Another thing, and I think Rick can attest to this, Keep your site organized, clean. 
pick up as you go. Um, for those that have spouses that want a clean kitchen, you know, clean as you cook, this is clean as you work. And we try and do that to eliminate slip, trip, and fall hazards. My personal belief is if they pay attention to this, then they'll pay attention to the work at hand. Uh, take pride and ownership in that. And so we're trying to emphasize at every job site there that they eliminate those. And proof's in the pudding when you come out to some of these sites and you see if they've taken it to heart. Um, we've got areas that we have where we're assembling, in this case here, soil nail, but we try and eliminate any slip, trip, and fall hazards that might be present there. Um, here's another one. There's a lot of stuff going on in our excavation site. A lot of lines, water hoses, air hoses, electrical lines, grout lines. And as much as you can keep them off the ground in the walking path, the better it is. And so one of the things that uh, we've done is to use J-hooks, or in some cases on the right, we've actually fabricated uh, an elbow angle iron elbow to one of the uh, beams. And you can just hang the hoses on there. And that way you've got a clear path to walk as you're around the excavation. And that, again, eliminates any trip hazards. Um, as I've mentioned before, we live in the Northwest. <laughs> and mud can be a hazard when it comes to slipping and tripping and falling. So in any of our areas there where we're like climbing ladders, you can see we have a uh, boot scraper. Basically, it's a sheet metal, corrugated sheet metal, placed on a wooden lattice. And that way, they can remove the mud from the excavation as they climb up the ladder because the wrong can get full of mud when you're going in and out of the hole. In fact, one of our incidents that we had that was a near miss is the worker got halfway up and he hit some mud and he slipped and fell. Fortunately, his foot caught one of the rungs, but he was dangling off the ground. Well, part of the issue as we went back is the rungs were dirty or muddy, I should say, and slippery. And so what we did was create a boot scraper at the base of the ladder. It doesn't do any good to have it at the top if they're tracking mud all the way up and down. Same thing on our paths when we're coming out of the excavation, uh, that we want to have a good working surface there. And so we've added some of these graded steel plates on the walkway around that area there so that they won't slip. Uh, something that's come into play, um, ladders tend to be, uh, as you get deeper, tend to be a main source of egress and access, but we're finding out that these adjustable stairs that you can see have several features that are better. Uh, the first thing you can see is the handrails. You've got three points of contact, two hands and then the feet, which allows you to carry your tools. <laughs> Otherwise, if you're on a ladder, what you're doing is you're getting a bag and a rope and you're pulling them up to, to get up the ladder. Uh, they also have the graded foot uh, steps as well. All these things can help to uh, maintain good traction and easy access and egress. Another best practice. Um, I don't know if Rick's seen this, but you know, as the excavation proceeds and you put in stair towers as part of the egress and access, uh, sometimes you have to work under them. As you can see, we're still continuing to go down. Well. I've seen in past cases where an excavator is swinging with its bucket and boom, and it may hit a stair tower because they forget that it's around. And so we'll put up things like buoys. You've seen them out in the bays that are the orange balls. We'll put up cones, but it's kind of a reminder to the operator if they're in close proximity to the stair tower that they watch where they're swinging. And these are really good. The other thing is, as you go down, and sometimes in utility bays, there's excavations, and they forget that the pathway can be on native soil. It's slippery and wet, and you can have these kind of tiered levels of access. And so you want to cone off areas there where there's a drop off. And uh, again, it's what's the pathway that's being traveled, and how can you protect someone from slipping or having the side cave in? Probably something near and dear to our hearts there is that we use rigging a lot <laughs> when we're lifting things. And daily inspection of our slings is critical because some of this stuff is passing over our workers or passing over other equipment. So we have them actively check all of the rigging, whether it's wire rope, 
whether it's chains, whether it's slings in this case. And we're looking to see what's the integrity of our, of our rigging. Got to do this because if you have something fail, it can not only uh, damage equipment, but you have people that are working. You don't want to be having fatalities due to failed rigging. Um, another one, <laughs> the ultimate, ultimate goal on a lot of these things is to provide electricity and power to the units that are in the excavation. Well, sometimes uh, these conduits are not marked that are behind the lagging walls. And people will still cut holes in those to maybe fill up with CDF. And if they're not marked, and you'll see later on an example I have, if they're not marked, someone can be cutting into these walls, and there's power lines or electrical conduits behind them. So you want to have them marked on the walls where they're located from top to bottom. In this case here, as they put in the stair tower, they forgot to mark as they went down. And it's like, oh my goodness, we've got, and we had to do more work on this wall. We went ahead and marked the location of those lines. So anyone working on that would be aware that there was power in that vicinity. Shocking, huh? Uh, COVID. Um, this was before uh, the QR codes came, which is a lot of the job sites there. You can hold up the phone, go to the QR code, and all the questions come out to access. This is a case where we were doing the paper copies, but we wanted to make sure that everyone coming on site basically had their temperature taken and met all the criteria uh, for COVID symptoms and COVID contact. We couldn't get onto the job site if, um, if you answered no to any of those. And then another thing we had was called a disinfection log, and that was all our equipment stuff was sanitized. We put down the times, the frequency and and what the pieces of equipment were done. So if anyone had any questions about how our workers were being protected, we had documentation for that. Uh, now, uh, at least up here in Washington on the QR codes, a lot of the um, things have been simplified. So once you put in your name, your address, your phone number, et cetera, it can be repopulated the next time you come on site. But there's basically two questions, COVID symptoms, those five and one, and the second one, have you been vaccinated? If you've been vaccinated, don't need to wear a mask. Um, and that's simplified things because in doing this COVID screening, that added to the time it took before we could start work. So it introduced, if you will, a uh, potential bottleneck. And so having the QR code there where one could scan and easily enter the stuff kind of made the process a lot more easier to complete and there was a record there that immediately went in the database. Um, so I mentioned that there are challenges with some of the work we do, and one of them has to do with when around the drill rigs and the potential problems with self-retracting lifelines. In this case here, um, he works with us now, but he was working for another company at the time. This was an individual who's self-retracting lifeline or the cable that extended from the device to the anchor point got caught in the drill rig. And I'm going to read you what he was doing because I said, you know, people need to know how this happened. Anyway, here's his story. Dan, here's what happened. And before I tell you the story, I remind everyone that make sure your static line is not worn out and it retracts and it's set up in a way that you don't use it and you're not forced to be in a blind spot with the operator. Here's what happened. I was shoveling spoil. So as you can see in the, in the drill rig auger there, as they uh, go down and drill uh, the hole, as they pull up, they have soil attached to the auger flight and they bring it out of the hole, they shake it, and the spoils fall and then they go back down. And a lot of times the dirt that's piled up, they will, when there's a break, they'll shovel that back down the hole uh, to clean off the site. Not the whole thing, but just to clean up the site so you can have a good walking surface. So it says, I was shoveling spoils into the drill hole. When the driller started, he started coming back. It was typical of us at the time to be sure that the drill rig wasn't turning at the time that we were shoveling and that they would see us as they were spinning off. Unfortunately, in this instance, I was in the blind spot. 
when the drill rig began swinging back and I was in the path, I tried to pull my yo-yo or SRL down so the static line would go underneath the bit. However, my yo-yo line would not retract back in and the slack was left in the pathway of the drill rig. The driller then took the auger flight, caught the line, and dragged me towards the hole. As soon as I hit the Kelly bar, which is what you see in the left side there, I was turned upside down and I went down the hole face first. I was upside down 10 feet with my arm pinned behind my back, like that. I, the fire department, fortunately, the drill rig operator saw me and stopped. Otherwise, if he would have dragged me down or started initiating drilling, I would have been chewed up. I was rescued by the fire department. They pulled me out with lagging, or not lagging, but uh, rigging. You can see that there. And they pulled me up a few inches at a time. However, my arm that was pinned behind my back was pulled out of its socket as I was raised. I suffered bruised and cracked ribs, a concussion, bleeding out of the ears, trigger finger, and lacerations, a torn rotator cuff, and contusions throughout my body. I remind everyone, stay out of the blind spot with the drill rig operator. Make sure your SRL is functioning and never take things for granted. So, you know, he survived, interestingly enough, He's now on the safety team. Um, I encourage you guys, don't get injured to become on the safety team. But that does sometimes happen. They're probably the best testimony of why safety is important. Um, here's another thing. We see this uh, more often than not, not on construction sites, but uh, at places like material service providers. Um, labor, uh, not labor, but uh, lumber yard, stuff like that. But here we have an aerial boom lifter we call a mobile elevated working platform and no hard hat, no harness, no SRL. And these things are like a catapult if they hit an uneven surface or an edge and uh, it can be like a rocket launcher. So this is just, hey, I'll hop in here, I'll go over and I'll change something. He's not prepared at all. Um, then there's the typical case sometimes where they step out of the cage to uh, get to their work and they may not be tying off or they may have their hand on the cage rail and consider that safe. Well, uh, you're kind of gambling uh, when this is when this goes on, but this is not uncommon. This was at a major site that we saw this work being done by others. Um, here's a case where um, our group was installing lagging boards that you see at the top of the picture there, but we had others that were putting in rebar reinforcement. In the process, they removed some of the, um, or they asked us to have the lagging boards removed, and we didn't have in the process any, um, I guess you would call that barricade. And so, well, on the other side where we're working, maybe only four feet or less on the other side it drops down about 20 feet and so it's essential that when others compromise or impact your job site that you look at the whole area its entirety and see what the thing what the problems could be in this case here our workers because this was less than 39 inches in height we had them tie off or put in barricades when they're working around uh, the area uh, there's another case there <laughs> We've got the handrail at the site, but uh, some of the workers uh, were opening that up to bring material into the hole, and so there was no handrail and 15, 20 foot drop off. And lo and behold, we've got an open spot there, and there's hoses and uh, loose boards. Uh, perfect slip, trip, and fall situation. Uh, we quickly corrected that, but told the others if they're going to remove that. To make sure that there's something there that prevents any any um, any falls. Uh, on the right, you can see a picture of uh, someone that has compromised the use of the handrail by putting a ladder over uh, over the edge, if you will, or above the uh, the top of the handrail, and he's just created another fall hazard there. 
Another case here where uh, others have uh, removed, if you will, uh, tow boards or they've removed some of the lagging boards to gain access to the hull, well, it leaves it wide open for any debris, which includes loose soil or tools to fall down. And if you have workers that are at the base of that, it's a wide open hole, if you will, for falling debris to uh, injure the workers. And so you need to always look up to the side and down to know what your potential hazards are. Uh, here's another one. This is one of the hazards of working indoors. You've got poor lighting. And sometimes the uh, issues of fall protection aren't always observed, in this case, barricades. So in an active working site, two open holes, stairwells, haven't been completed yet, and there's no warning, no guard lines, no nothing. And you can tell people have been traveling along the side there. Total fall hazard should be uh, barricaded off. Um, on the right, uh, there's a case there where we have uh, excavation that's going on. It's over uh, four and a half, six feet, and we should have some type of barricade, whether it's caution tape, cones, uh, marking the edge so people don't come off because it can slough off, and then you've got a potential twisted knee or ankle. So be aware of what we call the edges of our excavation. Um, one of my pet peeves about the use of ladders is not having a swing gate. And in this case here, you can see to gain access to this ladder, which would allow you, by the way, to walk through and set off to the side, we got an open spot, uh, you know, 25 feet above the ground. They got to step off into the grate wide open to access the ladder to go down. It should have uh, the wooden frame up to the edge, and then the swing gate would be in front of that. So you walk through and it closes behind. This is real common at uh, a lot of job sites there where the ones that are installing the ladders forget about the potential fall hazard just in accessing the ladder. And off to the right again, I think you see a picture of another open uh, ex open area leading down into the excavation that does not have any handrail whatsoever, an open spot. Uh, there's porta potties in back, and you know someone could be coming out of there and wanting to take a look and not realize that there's a significant drop off in that area. Uh, loose debris. This is a uh, typical that as you go down deep, uh, you need to have some method of preventing any loose debris from falling down on people. Uh, you can see that here we have a, a surveyor that is below uh, the lagging boards there and the handrail, and yet you've got this open face where there's loose soil that could fall. Uh, so tow boards are some type of a preventative barrier to keep loose rocks, pebbles, et cetera, from falling down is essential avoid debris. Uh, this happens a lot with uh, welders. Uh, when they're putting in these channels as part of their bracing, the horizontal bracing there in the excavations, they sometimes will leave their scrap material, tools, etc., in the channels instead of picking it up and taking it with them as they leave. And you have all this overhead material that is above where the workers are going to be. And all it would take would be a hose or vibration that could cause some of this to fall out. So we want our channels to be clean once the welders do their job. Um, got another one here. Stored energy. You guys have probably heard about this before. It's a potential energy, not kinetic, but uh, in the process of vibration or disturbance, it can fall. Uh, in this case on the left, what we have is soil erosion mats. They come in rolls, uh, several hundred pounds. Uh, for some reason, uh, they decided to, uh, others decided to store this above our lagging wall. And as we bring in our equipment there, there's the potential for that to possibly be knocked over. Uh, you know, what could it lead to? You know, uh, uh, basically it could have a strained neck, uh, hurt back if it were to fall, maybe even more. But bottom line is, we don't want to be having materials stored on the top of our boards where we're working. Uh, another thing here is an auger flight. Uh, interesting in that it was placed vertically instead of horizontally. Um, that thing weighs several hundred pounds. If that were to be clipped by any equipment, it would fall, easily crush uh, any individual that would be walking by. So this is a case here where that should have been laid horizontal and chopped. 
Uh, another case of stored energy. I'll, I'll take you to the one that probably draws your eyes closest. Uh, this is a vertical column that was going to be removed, but in support of that, there was dirt and concrete, and it was just left there. <laughs> and as we got heavy equipment around there, there's a potential for that if they're scraping or they're clipping it for that to fall down. That's kind of like the proverbial uh, boulder on the edge of a cliff, you know, remove it so that it doesn't have the potential to fall. Uh, in the other case here, we've got our soldier piles or beams that are laid down, and you want to keep them on a relatively flat surface. People do walk behind there to cut, make cuts, or to make penetrations. And uh, although that weighs, you know, thousands of pounds, if equipment were to roll or it were to be on an unstable surface, right now it's at an angle that could potentially lead to a crush by. So we'd want to get that level. Uh, stair towers. As the excavation goes down, a lot of times the stair towers will replace the ladders. And here's the walkway. Uh, in which uh, people access. And all of a sudden, you've got gaps there where you could step in, trip, fall, um, or go forward, either, you know, falling down the stairs or falling off to the side. Uh, we need to pay attention to that. Let the others know that, hey, our boards here are not, uh, not tight. Um, same thing on the right is you've got a walkway that's crossing over an excavation to get to a stair tower at the end. And you've got wet wood with mud slippery conditions. And the other thing is that missing from this, even though it shows on the left that it was inspected, is there should be a capacity and a weight indicated. How many people can be on that pathway at a time and what's the allowed weight? Uh, all this is critical to helping people understand what the limitations are of what they're working on. Uh, this is a pet peeve of mine that's having a site where We've got any debris that is picked up that could provide puncture either to the foot or to tires. This is very common to find when a building has been previously demolished and we're working at a site where some of that debris has been buried, but as we excavate, things start to appear. On the left, we have a um, wire, close proximity to the tires of uh, aerial boom lift, um, I couldn't pull this out, so I spray painted it for someone to come through there and to either uh, pull it out, which would be ideal, or if possible, when we got the saw to cut it. So this was taken care of after I brought it to their attention. Surprisingly enough, though, without it being spray painted, uh, it blended in perfectly with the uh, with the dirt. And the same thing here is we got a metal stake that's sticking out of the ground. Again, a possible puncture point uh, in an area uh, where there's work. Uh, hoses are part of our uh, work environment there. In this case here, we got a grout hose, and we always ask the uh, worker that's at the pump to constantly inspect the integrity of that. And you can see that through the process of abrasion, where it's rubbing against something, or where it's been lifted by a bucket with an excavator, we've got holes starting to produce. And because it is under pressure, you start to have an area of weakness that can be a blowout area. So we want them always checking the hoses for signs of wear and tear. Um, this is just, if you will, common things that occur that, you know, when you're at the site, you're using a lot of materials. And um, frequently, <laughs> they get filled up very fast. And you have spillover that can occur. And so it's, it's good to have a regular systematic time to empty out these um, these trash bins because they contain uh, nails, they contain <laughs> all kinds of materials that can possibly scrape, puncture, or injure, inject. And as we talked about before, control control the um, liquids that are produced on site, even if it is rain. In this case here, some uh, waffle socks would be great around this storm drain. The site's muddy, it's raining, and we've got high turbidity levels going down the storm drain, possibly into a stream. We can control that on site if we were to have some type of an absorbent sock uh, to keep or minimize the amount of buildup of sediment being transported. Um, this is something that's pretty common there is that a lot of things come on pallets or there's scrap wood that is used in constructing of crates or taking them apart. And with those come nails, with those come uh, sharp and jagged edges, and so we always encourage 
the workers to put these in an area like a cam lever box or in an area where they can be picked up, but just don't leave them around the job site. Uh, one instance that we had a couple years ago is our truck drivers that will be delivering equipment. They generally come early uh, to the job site before it begins to unload, and one of our workers got out and there were um, broken pallets and nails that were near the area where he was working. He stepped out of the truck and managed to step on a pallet board that had a three inch nail in the uh, fortune thing as it went between his toe and uh, other other digit there. And he was lucky, but because there was poor lighting and the pathway had been cleared uh, and he got out on the side where uh, he, he needed to, he, he stepped on one of these boards. So we made it a policy there for anyone working in the area, that they were to remove those at the uh, a after use, and especially if they're broken a discard, because unsuspecting people that come there like truck drivers that don't actually work on the side day to day, they're not quite aware of those hazards. This just kind of helps. It was a good reminder to uh, be aware. Um, some other things here is situational awareness. That be around your be aware of your surroundings. Uh, these were pictures of others taken. They all involve fall protection. But isn't it interesting, you know, they're behind the facade of a building. On the left, he's at the top rung of the ladder, a uh, two-legged ladder there, um, not tied off. And should he fall, uh, there's nothing there other than a wooden barrier at the base to possibly keep him from being saved. Um, just shocking to me that he's unaware of the potential danger. Same thing on the other one there. What's a proper anchor point or tie off there? He's above the excavation. I don't know if he's tying off on a cable rail or something, which isn't appropriate. But again, I guess with familiarity uh, with what they've done uh, comes complacency. And the same thing on the right there where you uh, guys working on a beam. I don't know if he's tied off uh, to a, a hook on the left or not, but nonetheless, uh, just the swing distance uh, from falling there, he's going to land on uh, the metal support. And again, this is one of the things should be tied off above as, as opposed to at the waist or at the foot. Um, if you remember, I showed the example of power being marked on the lagging boards. This was a care area where they were doing a cut. They were going to fill in the back. And in the process of cutting before they made the final plunge into the wall, uh, the individual felt something pulled out and lo and behold, there were electrical conduits. Uh, near miss, but scary than all get out. And so we uh, recommended strongly and had it done right away to have any electrical conduit that was put in by the electricians to be marked uh, where it was behind the wall so that this wouldn't happen again. Um, this one here, <laughs> where guys are basically in the bucket of an excavator, I know what probably happened. They didn't have a way to get from point A to point B, and they thought, well, we can just use the bucket and be transported. But, you know, those things aren't smooth in their transport. There's no tie-off point, and if that guy were just to stop or jolt suddenly, empty out the patrons. But, again, you know, think two steps ahead – what could possibly go wrong or what's wrong with this situation? Take two, uh, this could lead to a disaster. And I have seen this, by the way, more than once with some uh, some of our contractors. Um, I guess at the end, uh, we heard about, uh, yeah, but. Well, in this case here, uh, don't lead from behind when creating a culture of safety. And especially uh, make sure that you don't pretend to be a plumber when you're out here working on the site because someone may end up taking a picture of you and use that in the future. But anyway, I'm open for any questions. If there's anything that you'd want to discuss about what you've seen, uh, feel free to open up. By the way, his name is not Beavis. It's the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, I'm sorry. I just, when you showed me that yesterday too, I think I just laughed as hard now as I did yesterday. <laughs> oh my goodness. If only, does he have any idea? <laughs> he no, <knows>. he doesn't. <laughs> and I can say his face looks better than the, the, the part that's showing. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, we talked often about distraction. 
I was just going to say, we talk so often about distractions on the job site that could create hazard oh, conditions. Sorry. I can imagine rounding the corner and seeing that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, let me, yes. let me look it's at the queue here, sir. I didn't see any questions for you, Dan, that came through. However, we did have a couple of uh, mentions here. One, ironically enough, we had one of our friends up north in Washington State with Washington Dosh joining us, and he says, as uh, fate would have it, he just got called out to an excavation inspection with no shoring. What are the odds? <laughs> so he'll have to watch the rest of the presentation when we make it available in its recorded format. And then also, one of our own here within Oregon OSHA during your presentation, Dan, it uh, unfortunately reminded her of a... Uh, a uh, fatality that we investigated a number of years ago up at OHSU, where the victim was uh, pinched between the drill rig and the stem wall. And one of the potential contributing factors uh, to that, there were no witnesses to that event, but also the, um, the, the placement of the ladder, where it was, it was encouraging, in essence, employees to go that route uh, to the break area which was directing them right through the bite, right through the path of the bite from the drill rig. But also another potential contributing factor uh, could have been the individual being on their cell phone. And of oh. course, we have been seeing that more and more here over the years. Uh, we, we were goofing with the gentleman that looked like a, plum, a plumber being a distraction. But on a serious note, just the use of cell phones, Dan, and uh, coming across, uh, you know, folks out there that are texting or on the call um, and, and what that can contribute uh, on the job site to a potential hazardous condition. You know, Craig, I've got two thoughts here. Maybe this will trigger some discussion. Um, in some cases, I've, I've seen workers on the job site that have what you call earbuds. Uh, that basically they can play music and they say, well, the earbuds maybe help to uh, prevent, uh, you know, noise uh, damage there. But uh, what I've seen there is, first of all, it doesn't have the assigned protection factor necessary. But probably more importantly, you put those earbuds in and you're listening to music, uh, it distorts or distracts you from maybe getting uh, verbal commands or hearing noise from other equipment. And we've seen more potential near misses from those that are wearing earbuds because they're unaware of the sounds and the communication. Uh, second thing, and I hope this doesn't cause some concern, but um, with COVID, a lot of the workers were having to wear masks. And two of the safety hazards that occurred uh, that were common, one you've probably heard a lot of, but that is a lot of the safety glasses that were being worn uh, fogged up very easily from the condensation. We tend to notice it more uh, during the winter uh, when the temperatures don't lead to evaporation, but we had a lot of fogging glasses. And where that was a concern was if they're walking on an edge or near an edge and you've got a drop off there, you know, I said, take off the glasses temporarily, clean them, but don't walk with fog glasses. Uh, the second thing is, is that we've got three forms of communication out there at the job sites. One's the radio, but sometimes there's a lot of chatter there, so hand signals. But believe it or not, uh, some of our older workers read lips. They read lips as well as trying to hear, and the mask took away that ability. Yeah. So just kind of interesting. Also, I don't know if you've seen it, if anyone's got an accent and you put a mask over it, <laughs> <laughs> duplicate. Try going through a fast food place and trying to order a large orange shake and fries <laughs> and try and hear someone trying to repeat your order back. And it might be a little bit more difficult. But those were just some of the hazards that were introduced as part of as part of COVID, which I thought was kind of interesting there, that it created its own set of, of challenges among the other things being overheating and exertion there when you're lifting a lot of heavy boards and stuff and you've got a mask yeah. over there. Uh, we found a lot more breaks were necessary, and again, the communication was always a chance. They step away, make sure that you allow for, if you will, a chance to catch your breath, especially going up and down those stair towers, <laughs> you know, 40, 50 feet a couple times a day with the mask on. Ah, kind of tough. <laughs>
Yeah. Well, and it just reminds us, and everybody on the call, of course, realizes all too well how important communication is, and the importance of the of the you know the pre tasks, the um, uh, you know a lot of contractors doing stretch and flex, using that opportunity to chat about the the task that day, uh, creating in essence a stand down, if you will, and that was yeah. mentioned by one of our own here in the chat as well. It just you know the importance of communication and if a drill rig was moved now to an area where it could create a pinch point because employees are using that pathway to a break, you know, should we have stopped, talked about it, make sure everybody is aware on the same page. Obviously we can should have, could have, and would have until the cows come home and an investigation reveals all that, but it's way too late if we're in the investigation mode. I will say so. something that you triggered, Greg, that's really good. And that is that, uh, sometimes there's this mentality with the pre-task plan, well, I filled it out in the morning. But yeah. as you know, a uh, couple things. One, weather changes pretty frequently up here in the Northwest, which could introduce rain or it could dry things out, or whichever, but, you know, so you dust <laughs> or slippery conditions. You've got that. But the other other aspect is that as we go deeper, you know, put on my geology hat now, your soil conditions are changed. You could go from a cobbly uh, slip, trip, and fall with boulders or gravels or stuff to a clay. And if you're getting into the water table, all of a sudden now you've got the component of slippery working surface. So, you know, with depth comes change. And I think the biggest thing that they realize is adjust to the site conditions. And it doesn't have to be weather or soil. It can also be maybe someone's coming into your work area that's bringing another piece of equipment and the swing radius we had an incident that happened maybe two weeks ago and in, uh, an individual was killed on the 520 extension near Montlake Terrace and he was between the uh, truck and the wall and as they were unloading that bucket a uh, question he was out of sight um, and the communication wasn't there they haven't done the full investigation but that brings up the point that when you're getting into your areas, make sure that you're not in an area that will not allow you an escape route or that you can be seen. Because when those buckets swing, you know, it's worse than a, a man-eating linebacker. It will nail you. And in this case here, uh, sternum and the chest was, was collapsed. Uh, unfortunate, unfortunate. Guy had been around for a while, had six kids. Um, you know, very tragic there, and it can happen in an instant. Complacency is very, very real, and it's very dangerous. Well said, sir, and that was fantastic. And Dan, not only was that a fantastic presentation, you put us back on uh, uh, back on time here with another 10-minute break. I'm looking back thinking, what was I thinking 15-minute breaks? We don't need 15-minute breaks. So let's reconvene at 11 o'clock. And that puts us right back on uh, the pace the agenda directs us. And Mr. Matt Janning will be joining us for the final piece of this morning's webinar. Dan, thank you so much. Everyone, we will reconvene at 11 o'clock Pacific time, 10 minutes from now. All righty, welcome back, everybody. And David, my apologies. I saw your question in the chat about asking what the next topic is, and then I got distracted chatting with a few others and, and reminiscing about old times. So uh, David asked what the next topic is, and I'm going to allow Mr. Matt Janning to uh, introduce his ne next topic as Matt finishes our morning webinar here this morning. And again, thank you all for attending. Uh, Mr. Matt Janning is with Pacific Foundation. And I'll allow Matt, of course, to introduce himself more so, but we are certainly lucky to have him. Um, I had the opportunity to meet Matt a handful of years ago, of course, through our relationship, even, even if I remember right, Matt, even slightly before our formal uh, agreement uh, that was made with uh, the West Coast chapter of ADSC, and then bumping into you at a handful of conferences over the years, and can only hope that it gets back to uh, that state of normalcy and we can bump into each other at conferences yet once again. So for this final hour from 11 to 12 or so before we wrap up, everyone, please welcome Mr. Matt Jannings of Pacific Foundation. Matt Jannings, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to get up here and talk to everybody. 
So I'll just get right into it. Almost every day that our crews are working, at some point, I'm thinking to myself that I hope I have succeeded in providing the men and women in the field the tools to complete their tasks safely. Have we thought of and prepared for all the different variables that can occur on a project? In a lot of scenarios, a mistake or a tiny detail missed could spell disaster. I don't think I need to spell out all the possibilities. I think we all get it. That is why a partnership like this one is so important. It's the common goal that we all have. None of us want to see a fellow worker get injured or worse. We want to examine and adjust where necessary. Apart, we have all been doing this, but now as we move forward, we are all gonna be facing these challenges together as a team. With this collaboration of professionals, we can facilitate the safest environment possible at every level. So how do we do it, you may ask? This event is a great starting place. It gives us all the opportunity to relay our side of the process, the challenges that we face. This will give us all a better understanding. We are networking and no value can be put on that. Every great leader needs a network of individuals and support to answer the hard questions. And if there are no obvious answers, we will have a great collaboration of professionals to assess the situation. So over the next 23 slides, I'm gonna do my best to give you a quick rundown on some challenges, remedies, and personal experiences. I will discuss such riveting topics like equipment, rigging and hoisting rebar cages, grout mixing and pumping, tieback testing and de-stressing, and we'll finish it with falls and struck by. I do believe I will go into the weeds a bit, but you are all here with me and we're together. I will not be going into great, teal, great detail on everything, but I will do my best to convey pertinent information. So the equipment that we use in the industry is really the same that everybody else uses, except that we have one outlier, the drill rigs. In the drilling industry, there is quite a variety of drills. Although the equipment is basically the same, they are different manufacturers and different designs. But one thing that they all have in common is they make holes in the earth. These holes can be small three inch diameter holes, or they can be on the extreme size of 20 feet in diameter. So a typical challenge that we may face with our equipment is it can be frighteningly large. A Bauer BG55 has a vertical mass of over 120 feet tall and a weight of over 400,000 pounds. This is not a piece of equipment that you can just track around the site. As Rick Marshall discussed in his working platform topic, there is a set standard that all drill contractors can hold up, a clear and concise document. Until this standard across the industry, we were all continuing to attend pre-construction meetings. And in these meetings, we were supplying the general contractor with equipment statistics, the weights and the pressures, the capabilities, but it almost never fails. The first time a general contractor sees the drill roll in with its minion of flatbed trucks, they stand eyes wide. Other times they may be unfazed and think that we can just operate this equipment like it's an excavator. <clears throat> Thankfully, we are not interested in what a tipped over drill rig looks like. We all know what that looks like. 
if we have concerns, we will never say, let's see how it goes. <laughs> Excuse me. We work with the GC to make sure that we are set up for safety and success. We need to make sure that our working platforms are workable. We need to make sure the site is accessible for our scope of work. And we cannot move forward until all the boxes are checked. Another challenge that we face is that we really use the heck out of our equipment. And with lots of use comes lots of maintenance. We constantly need to make sure that our equipment is in good working order. We have a team of competent individuals to assess and address any problems that may occur. This assess and address comes from our daily inspections and our detailed inspections at least once a week. We will have a mechanic on site and they will work with the operator and the front end men to inspect and address any concerns. We are not scared to pull a drill from service due to an issue. As a matter of fact, we believe it's our moral obligation to do as such. We would much rather be late than cause a terrible accident. Another challenge that we face is that we're excavating the earth. In an open hole scenario, we are having employees working around this hole and we must make sure that we have appropriate protection in place. I ask you, is a parachute protection? I think not. But a corral system or leaving the casing high, and if that fails, we're 100% tie off. Our operators are trained to make sure the ground employees are accounted for when swinging back to the hole. Eyes on is our motto. And it's funny that I bring up training because the ADSC and the NC3O have worked in collaboration to create a drill rig operator certification. To run a crane, you need a certification. To run a drill as it stands, it's up to the company to deem you competent. And that's all changing. This effort to create a standardized certification is fully underway. Individuals have already gone through training. But as it goes with everything in the last year and a half, just as all that got started, we were struck by COVID. It put a damper on the certifications, but we have been adapting and overcoming. We have continued to train and certify operators. A standardized certification has, and it will take a lot of hard work, but anything worth doing will take time and dedication. So we have the best minds working on this. <clears throat> I would like to now go on and discuss rigging and hoisting of rebar cages. Picking rebar cages is not something that we take lightly. We are not naive to the facts. We are picking a steel structure that is tied together using wire. On the surface, that sounds pretty scary. But really, no matter what way you look at it, it's scary. As with the equipment, rebar cages vary vastly in size and weight. Not only that, how they constructed is different. With all that in mind, when we're putting a job together, we are delving into the picking process. We have multiple high level individuals working on the plan. We all create a comprehensive pick plan. For the larger cages and the cages with CSL tubes, we often need to do an assisted pick. Assisted picking helps protect the cage from any deformation. If you break a CSL tube, your test will fail and the structural ability of that shaft will come into question. And these are not questions that can go unanswered. This will cost everybody down the line money. These assisted picks need to be straightforward in terms of rigging. 
depending on the size and length, it could range from a forklift tailing the cage to a rolling block system and two cranes to ensure a flat pick. We are taking the time to create a critical lift plan in this case. We leave no stone unturned. It is always our belief that we need to be in total control. No cage swinging, no rigging sliding through a block unintentionally. Once all the engineering and planning are put into effect, we are inspecting the cage on the ground and it's picked to watch for any parts or pieces that may dislodge. Sometimes we will place it in an open hole and other times it will be a shaft already filled with concrete. Either way, we're having individuals at ground zero guiding or adding centralizers as the cage goes into the shaft. They put great effort in making sure the constructural ability of the cage is sound. Things can shift and we need to be ready. Cage inspections are crucial. One of the other challenges um, that you all need to be aware of is that when we have a cage in the air, we have some work to do on the cage. Whether it's removing the stabilizers or adding centralizers or removing the rigging, there will be a brief time when a cage is stationary. It is our responsibility to make sure all personnel not critical to the cage setting process are at least 1.5 times the length of the item picked away from the process. At face value, that sounds like no problem, and sometimes it is easy. But when the cage is 100 feet long and the size of the job is 200 feet, it will cause serious issues with the general contractor and all other trades on site. It has been my experience that the GCs want to stack as many trades in the smallest areas possible. This makes it very difficult to delineate three quarters of an entire job to make a pick. We have a job now where we're setting cages on what's a medium sized job and the cages are 60 to 100 feet long. And there are 179 cages going into the ground there. Thankfully, the general contractor is great and they have not planned on having multiple trades at the job site at the same time. Maybe our project managers had something to do with that. Maybe the general contractor had foresight, but we are not always so lucky. We must put our foot down multiple times a year to make sure that we're within the safety standards. But honestly though, it's not even just about following the rules. It's about doing the right thing. I have seen a soldier pile fall from the sky. I have seen rebar cages come undone at the seams. Keeping people away is the least that we can do. Our employees are trained and made aware of the possibilities while making these picks. A general laborer picking up scraps for an electrician's work, they have no inkling of what the possibilities are. So it's our moral duty to protect all those individuals that may come into our zone. Once the cage is in the hole, the dangers are greatly minimized. And then we rinse and we repeat. Of course, there is much more detail put into that. But in the sense of time, just giving you some bullet points that we, at a future date, we can all have this collaboration and we can work together and we can help build a better understanding of what's expected. A few years ago, a standard was created protecting workers from the dangers of silica. That's a great move. I don't know if everybody fully understood the dangers associated with silica. There were times in my life where I would be mixing grout or I would be working the front of a drill 
and we would be surrounded by dust. I mean, I would be dancing through it. Looking back, I would equate that to shooting GI Joes out of each other's hands with BB guns. We were completely oblivious to the dangers. And I also have a personal dog in this fight. My father, who is also a driller, worked in an iron ore mine in Missouri. He was the operator that would be drilling into solid rock so the crews could come in and blast for new shafts. He said that they would just be swimming in dust. It was always just the biggest joke to them. But now his lungs have diminished to a point where he can no longer do the things that he loves the most. The dangers of silica. When we were made aware of the dangers, we started taking steps immediately. Of course, we could have just forced everybody to go straight into respirators, but actually that's exactly what we did. But we don't like using PPE. If we can engineer the dangers away, that's a win-win. So we bought a particulate tester and we started testing everything we did involving dust. It was no surprise that mixing grout was our largest creator of silica. <clears throat> so we brainstormed and we came up with a system for the grout plants that dropped the levels below the Pell most of the time. What we did is we built a misting system that is installed around the circumference of the mixing cylinder. When our worker is breaking bags, the mister not only mists above the cylinder, but right at the threshold. This dual misting creates a barrier stopping the dust from exiting the cylinder. And it works most of the time. So we keep all of our grant plant operators trained up on respirators. If it's a windy day, or if there's other factors, the dust could still be blown around and the misting system may not be working as well as intended. But we're always more safe than sorry. We have been switching over to auto mixing systems. No exposure to dry grout, best method yet. Not always applicable though. They are large and you need to have access for a truck to refill, so it's not always the best choice. Some of you may not even know why we're mixing grout. A vast majority of the shoring projects require us to install a tendon system that holds vertical shoring walls in place. We call them tiebacks. It is typically a multiple strand system that's installed into the shoring beam horizontally. We then pump pure grout into these tiebacks to anchor them into the existing earth. This system keeps the shoring pit from collapsing from outside forces. It is a crucial step. Pumping the grout to the bottom of the tieback is pretty easy. Very little danger involved. A plug can occur from time to time, but communication and cleanliness are key. In some cases, the risk can be elevated. In some materials, we need to post the grout, the tiebacks. That usually occurs the next day after installation. We must pressure up the system. There are rubber gaskets on the post grout tube and that allows you to fill or pressurize any voids in the tieback. This can cause issues with the system though. If you don't have some sort of measurement system built into the line, you have no idea how much storage energy is there. The grout line is attached to the post grout tube with a threaded adapter. I have seen these fail. And when that happens, Grout tends to go everywhere. To prevent this, we have installed a pressure gauge and a valve system in every system. That way, the operator and the workers know how much energy is in the system 
and can alleviate the pressure if need be. You see, these plants are one-way systems. There is no backing off. So every system must have a valve to release pressure. No more controlled cutting of the PVC to release the pressure. Whatever we can do to minimize grout contact to the employees, it is not an inert substance. It can cause chemical burns in some people. So we take a lot of steps to make sure that our crews understand the dangers and we provide them with the appropriate PPE, rubber gloves, long sleeves, and we have plenty of water to make sure that they wash it off constantly. We also have vinegar at every job shack to make sure that if somebody does start to get grout burn, we can use the vinegar to neutralize the chemical immediately. The next step in the process of tie backing comes three days later. We now need to apply tension to the tie back. This involves some sort of hydraulic ram, some wedges, some stress heads, and a buttload of pressure. I find it amazing how much pressure we put into tie backs and micropiles. The pressure you apply is measured in kips. One kip equals 1,000 pounds of force. We have tested to more than 1,000 kips. That is over a million pounds of force. That is incredible. But historically, there have been some failures. What and where matters in this case. If the tieback fails deep underground, you just may hear a faint whoomp. Your dial gauge will jump and the pressures will change. Others may fail near the production stress head. This is a bit more obvious, not a violent failure, but noticeable. Then we have the strand failure between the production head and the master head inside the ram. This is where a failure can get scary. I have seen wedges shoot out of a master head and fly a hundred feet. Although this type of failure is rare, it does occur. Because of that, we treat every tensioning the same. We delineate the area straight out and nobody is allowed to move past during a test. We also take rags and wrap them around the tail ends of the cable. If there is a failure, the rags will drag the strand and the wedge in a downward arc. Using this technique, I have had a strand fail in the danger zone and it negated the effects fully. The strand didn't even exit the ram. Typically, we are also using a mini excavator to move the ram around. So we even take it one more step just in case we park the excavator in the direct path of the test. It's used as a barrier in case of a failure. So with such tremendous forces at hand to double up the efforts is a win. For our largest test, that is a whole different ball game. We need to make sure that it is fully planned, that our testing beam is engineered, that we have the best tester on site to set up the system. Nobody is allowed the, around the RAM. We delineate the entire area because a failure at a million pounds could launch heavy gear unexpectedly into the air. After the test is complete and there are no failures and everything looks great, the tieback is locked off at the appropriate force. The whip ends are cut off but not all tiebacks are designed to have a cap over the stress head. So the cut strands can be sharp. So we do our best to cut using no angles and we try to eliminate any sharp edges. One reason they don't cap all the strands is that if the wall is temporary, we must go in and de-stress the tiebacks. <clears throat> I personally, get great satisfaction out of de-stressing tiebacks. 
there is something satisfying about heating up a strand and watching it get sucked into the wall. What I don't like is when the stress head is inlaid two feet into a poured wall. It puts you in a position that's not ideal for slag blowback. So to mitigate this, we use demo torches, welding hoods, and leathers. Another issue with de-stressing is that it's usually inside a parking structure or some like environment. When these walls are built, a fair amount of foam is used to block out the tieback profile. That foam is of course flammable and creates a large amount of smoke in the process. Not an acceptable environment for anybody to work in. In cases like this, we use a smoke eater. It is similar to a large shop back, but has an amazing HEPA filter that scrubs the air. The sucking end has a large wide inlet and a system of magnets to hold it in place. If no metal is in place, then you have to get creative. But with the use of smoke, of smoke eater and fans, it lowers the smoke level to nearly zero. It's an effective system. We also bring a hose or a backpack sprayer to make sure there are no hot spots, and then we maintain the typical fire watch. The last two topics I would like to cover are falls and struck by. This is not a drilling industry problem. This is an every job problem. Every worker, whether you work in an office building or in the cheese factory, are in dangers of slips, trips, and falls. Struck by typically is more isolated to the physically mandated tasks, but could happen in other cases. In the drilling industry, a lot can happen. Falls continue to be the leading cause of death in the construction world. I personally know one person that fell to their death. Of course, it was a task that he had completed a thousand times before and nothing ever happened. But with a fall, it just takes one. You don't even need to fall from heights for it to be disastrous. If you fall and hit your head on a curb or a chunk of rock, it could be a traumatic brain injury, or it could just flatline you. And because of this fact, we must take slips, trips, and falls deadly serious. In the drilling world, our equipment doesn't always come in one piece. Our BG-55 takes seven trucks to load it on site. Some assembly required, it said. Most of the assembly can be done from the ground, and portions of it uh, need to be done from a ladder or a man lift. We do run into issues, though. We don't want to use ladders. So some of the assembly is only five feet off the ground. And if you're using the standard six-foot lanyard, you're hitting the ground so fall protection won't even be utilized. So we've switched over to using retractable lanyards and man lifts. This will make sure, barring some extraordinary circumstance, that if a worker does fall out, a system is in place that will protect them as intended. We also mount retractables on the drill rigs. Before the catwalks are fully mounted, we wanna make sure that our crews are protected from a fall. Thankfully, we have never had to use a harness for its intended purposes, and that's great. But at the same time, because none of us have seen it happen, it does tend to bring in some complacency. It can just creep in and convince people, don't worry, you're okay. You're just climbing 12 feet up. You've done this 500 times in your life. But like previously mentioned, it just takes one time. You may be perfectly competent at climbing, maybe even on the same level as the famous free climber, Alex Hanold. But what about the circumstances that you are not prepared for? 
How about a bee stings you in the web of your finger or a bird swoops down and buzzes your face? We could make up an endless list of what ifs, and it's those what ifs that we need to try to protect everybody from. It is not a sign of weakness to wear fall protection. Personally, I think it's a sign of intelligence. Someone that has the foresight for possibilities. Like I said, falls don't always come from height. There are some challenges with fall protection. If you are unloading a truck of rebar cages and it's stacked too high, how can you do that safely? when there's nothing to tie off to. What we've started to do is we have our own trucking, so we control the loads and make sure they are stacked to acceptable heights. We also work with the manufacturers if we are not trucking the materials. We don't always need a reason to fall because sometimes we're just slipping and tripping over our own feet. So, of course, site cleanliness is always paramount. We are not indestructible young bucks out there. I mean, for goodness sake, I was down and out because I bent over to unplug a PlayStation. Seriously pathetic, I know. So a simple slip on a steel sheet could be a broken wrist or a hurt back. So at last, we are going to slip, trip, and fall into my final topic, struck by. I really like how this is worded, struck by. Struck by what, you might add? Well, the answer is everything. You can be struck by anything at any time on a construction site. I bet at some point, somebody has been struck by a poodle that's why it's left as struck by so how do you protect against a world of possibilities well with any problem you have to start small piece by piece you will build up an understanding of what the possibilities are most come through experiences others come from a collaborative effort like this one Throughout my 17 years in drilling, I have witnessed many struck bys. I have personally been involved and the recipient of a significant number of struck bys. They range from hitting myself on the finger with a waffle head hammer or being knocked to the ground by a chunk of clay that flung off of an auger. I have one specific experience that I would like to share in this topic. You know, build our understanding and all. I was on a crew and we were installing some number 12 all thread rebar anchors. The shafts were approximately 90 feet deep. So we had to couple together two 40 foot sections. Remember, we were very smart. Marine grade epoxy is very slippery. So while rigging, we put an extra coupler at the top just to be sure that while we were screwing the end together, the rigging would not possibly slip off the top. Well, the rigging stayed on just as intended. But what we did not anticipate is the rigging unscrewing the coupler at the top 20 times, and it never occurred to us that this was possible. Without warning, a 12 pound coupler fell from 40 feet up and struck the foreman on the brim of his hard hat, which thankfully deflected it to his shoulder. The impact instantly knocked him unconscious. It was the most terrifying thing I had ever witnessed on a job site. To see my leader and my mentor and my friend fall face first in the mud. Thank the lucky stars that missed his head. But in the end, the injury was minor. But the lesson could have cost so much more. So how do you protect yourself from something that you didn't even know was possible? We started with communication. Every incident 
no matter how small gets communicated, not just with our employees, we are fully transparent with the general contractors as well. We are making sure that we're learning from these lessons and teaching everybody else with the same lessons. We also started bringing in multiple crew members during the planning stage for a project. <clears throat> the men and women have extremely valuable things to contribute. It gives them a sense of ownership to be part of the planning project. And we also teach awareness. Being a former infantryman, I quite literally had awareness beat into me. And while I may want to beat it into some of the employees, I do my best to reframe. Instead, I use my experiences and my professionalism to train those around me to think outside the box. We don't want robots mindlessly and robotically completing tasks. We want our employees to be thinking, intelligent, and aware human beings. We want every employee to have the means to recognize something before it occurs. As an individual, I am only as good as my experiences teach me. Unfortunately, I don't know everything and haven't experienced every possibility, but just like we are doing here, we are utilizing all of our experiences to improve the industry. As individuals, we are only so good, but as a team, there is no mountain that we cannot move. I wanna thank the ADSC and Organosha for creating this bond. The world that we live in is dangerous. The work that we complete is a whole nother layer on top of that. It is gonna take teamwork on all sides to make sure that we have the safest possible environment to work in. No worker comes to work wanting to get hurt and no employer wants to put their workers in harm's way. I believe in this collaboration of great minds. We can all work towards a singular goal of no incidents and no injuries. We cannot forget that the most valuable assets in every company are the employees that fill our ranks. So as I do in all my presentations, I would like to leave you with a final quote. And this quote is from Margaret Mead. And she said, never doubt the small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you. And that will conclude my presentation. Well, thank you there, Mr. Jannings. Much appreciated. And thank you so much for taking time out of your valuable day and You're being welcome, a sir. part of this. Um, the 17 years you shared, your insight, your perspective, your expertise, and looking at the pictures, great pictures. I, I'm just fascinated with the, the lifting of rebar column for some reason. There's a handful of things in this world that fascinate me and, and <laughs> that has always fascinated me, the, the size and complexity and the difficulty of handling those and of course the dangers that come from that. I had to chuckle though, Matt, when you were talking about how um, it was a fall hazard. They're not just unique to this industry, of course. They can be anywhere from the cheese factory to, and I was gonna stop you right there, but I didn't wanna interrupt. Did you by chance just uh, visit Tillamook not long ago and cheese factory was in your mind? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do enjoy if them, you haven't so. in a while, they renovated and they still have delicious ice cream. Probably pretty good cheese, too, but I tend to focus on the ice cream. Um, but thanks again, sir. Truly appreciate it. Uh, so we can wrap a little early for this morning, uh, this webinar at least, and prepare for tomorrow's webinar, which will be full of beneficial information and, again, perspective and expertise coming to you from the Association of Drilled Shaft Contractors. Rick Marshall will be a good portion of tomorrow's webinar, along with uh, Matt Kaiser and Brian Snap representing Oregon OSHA, 
in the final hour that will provide you all some updates um, as it pertains to our infectious disease prevention rule, as well as a new directive that will be coming from us um, that addresses the proper identification of underground utilities that has not been released yet to the public. So it'll be kind of a sneak preview uh, for tomorrow. But uh, without any further ado, I do not see any questions in the chat. And it's a beautiful day, so maybe getting out 15 minutes prior to when the agenda says we're done is not a bad thing. So from this morning's webinar, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Matt. And thank you all for attending. And we will see you tomorrow morning at 8.30. And you have a separate invite for tomorrow's session, so make sure you use that. And we will see you all tomorrow morning at 8.30 Pacific time for the conclusion of this two-part webinar. Thank you Thanks, all. Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.